we're almost there. We're waiting for the lady mayoress, whose name is Donald Gagan. And uh, he's just be with us shortly. Uh, I'm delighted to say that Minister Oshin Smith has arrived from the Parliamentary Party. And uh, that's the Green Party Parliamentary Party. Yes. And I left earlier. Well done, Pippa. And, uh, <laughs> and Malcolm Byrne has told me that he's so dedicated to this meeting that he skipped the Fianna Fáil Parliamentary Party meeting, which is great. Well done, Malcolm. It's, uh, it's, it's all right, Pat Lee. He's going to tell me what's happening. <laughs> <laughs> Not much. <Yeah. laughs> So uh, I should say, I should introduce myself, I'm uh, John Gormley, and uh, former member of the Green Party Parliamentary Party, uh, and now for my sins I'm on the board of management of Green Foundation Ireland. Uh, and I'm really delighted to see so many people here because we actually thought uh, that because of the good weather, quite a few people would register and then cancel. Well, you didn't cancel, and thank you very much because it promises to be a very interesting evening, and it's a debate that is ongoing. It's a debate that happens all the time in Green parties, is how can we get the message across? Um, if you observe even in Germany, German, where the, you know, German politics, very interesting, always very interesting, but at the moment there is a real problem within government between the various parties on a simple issue like changing the heating laws. Uh, and again, the Greens being cast um, as uh, you know, the bad, bad guys, I suppose. But we're not here just to talk about you know, the Greens as a political party. We're here to talk about the Green movement in general and how to get that message across. Because we all know this, that you encounter prejudices from the very start. There is a stereotype, perhaps. Sometimes we play into that. But other times, it's just there. And I recall uh, when we entered government back in 2007. And uh, it was early days of the government. And there was a meeting on of the United Nations on climate change. It was to take place in Bali. And I remember saying to, I'm not giving any secrets away here, I'm just saying it to other cabinet members, we were to talk about a major issue. And I said, look, we can discuss that when I get back from Bali. And um, there was kind of a silence a uh, bit there. And then um, someone asked me, he says, well, what's on in Bali? He says, this is the UN Conference on Climate Change. And then Michal Martin, who was beside me, and I have huge respect for Michal, get on great with him, but he turned and he says, oh, thanks be to God. I thought you said, uh, when you get back from Bali. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and that... I, that said it all, you know, I mean, they, have, they had us pegged as these very strange, that I was going to swan into the cabinet room in a leotard and do a, do a pirouette or whatever. It, you know, it took a while for people to understand that we were normal people, that we would support, you know, we go to a rugby match maybe, or, you know, we like to maybe occasionally to go for a pint or whatever it is. Uh, there's a, there is this idea, uh, and all the time, and particularly... I have to say, in rural Ireland, this urban-rural divide uh, that you encounter all of the time. So what we're trying to do tonight is tease out some of these difficulties. I've said to everybody, and by the way, thank you so much to all our wonderful guests for turning up here tonight. Um, and I've said, look, it's no holds barred. Say whatever you want to say. There's no problem there, because we want a rigorous debate. And so now it's my great pleasure to hand over to our very able chairperson, uh, Alison O'Connor. Thank you, Alison. John, thank you very much, and thank you for the invitation to chair this evening's proceedings. And it's on a topic that really, as a journalist, is of great interest to me. Um, and um, I think that also for the Green Party is one that's, that's well worth uh, teasing out. Um, I think given the, the uh, you've seen the, the panels that we have, two panels this evening, a media panel and a political panel, and I think given the, the people that are chosen and involved, it's going to be a really interesting discussion. And I admire that John said, uh, and said to, to the panelists beforehand as well, to say whatever it was they wanted to say, not to hold back. 
and um, I'm hoping that the two members of the Green Parliamentary Party who are here beside me will do the same when it comes to their meeting that they just left because while we will all be able to find what happened in the Fine Fáil and the Fine Gael meeting through social media, it happens less so, a lot less so with the Green Party, so that if they're feeling in a frank mood, they might, um, they might be inclined to share. But look, I won't delay um, any further. I, um, my first job of the evening is uh, to um, welcome the Lord Mayor of Dublin, Caroline Conroy, who is going to speak. Caroline was just saying that her term of office is just difficult to believe, and she was saying this is going to end very soon, towards the, the end of the month, and how much she has enjoyed the year and what a privilege it has been. So Caroline is going to kick off proceedings for us. Thank you very much, Alison, and thank you very much to the ministers, TD, senators, councillors, colleagues, friends, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, delighted that you could all um, make it to my gaff. Um, you're very much welcome. A bit of history about the room itself, the Oak Room. It was built in 1715 after a discussion with Joshua Dawson when he was selling his home in 1715 to Dublin Corporation. Dublin Corporation was looking for a permanent home for the mayor at the time and uh, had a look at the house, didn't think it was big enough because they wanted to entertain and show off their wealth and said to Joshua, look, not big enough unless you have you built on a, a big entertaining space, we're not interested. So Joshua built the Oak Room and uh, so this room has stand, stood here since 1715 and has been used for all sorts of gatherings and tonight I'm delighted that it's been held for this really important discussion. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. So, just a few things. I would like to commend the Green Foundation for its tremendous work in assembling us all here this evening to listen to the excellent panels and contribute to this much needed discussion. The event is built around an important theme. How can we ensure that green messaging is effective? How do we make sure that our communications get through? Why we should build a greener future? and how we should do it. How do we make sure that our communications is based on clear understandings of where people are at that speaks to them, is accessible and persuasive? By the way, when I say we, I mean every person who is concerned about the mistakes us humans have made and the systems we have created and the destruction we have let loose upon the world. I mean all of us who want to get it right, who want to ensure a better, greener future, not just politicians, not just NGOs and campaigners, but citizens who see the future and want it to be bright. I'm really looking forward to this discussion because I think we really need to get better at this. This is not an acad academic matter. This is a live issue that affects the future of our planet. Awareness is important and doing the right thing is even better, but it's not enough. We need to build a wider platform we need to get society behind the efforts to create a better world. It's not good enough for us to get it when it comes to climate or biodiversity. It's not good enough for our governments to get it. And it's definitely not good enough for us to leave our media, both traditional and new media, to be dominated by vested interests and bad faith actors. We cannot leave the stage to others. We have an obligation, a moral obligation, to get our communications right. If we think that we're on the side of the angels and leave our communications to others, then we're failing. If we believe that being on the right side of history is the main thing, then we could fail to make history. We simply must get on the stage and engage and win in the public sphere. We must put our best foot forward. We must shape the debate. When I was a child, I read Dr. Seuss's book, The Lorax, and I'm sure many of you have also watched it on TV or cinema or read the book also. It's a great story. A boy living in a polluted area meets a strange man, the Wunzlier, who tells him the story of how years earlier he had arrived in a beautiful land dominated by the forest of truffle trees and a wide diversity of animals. He cut a tree down and used it to knit an attractive piece of clothing called a teed. But a creature, the Lorex, popped up and gave out to him. He spoke for the trees. 
The Wunsleer sold the Thede and went on to build a big business, chopping down the truffle trees by hand, then by machine, opening a shop, employing his relations, and building a huge factory to grow and grow the business. The forests deforest, and despite the warnings of the lorics, the Wunsleer biggered everything, and the land became choked with pollution and the animals died or left. Eventually, one of the machines cut down the last truffle tree. The business failed, and all the Wunsleer's relatives left. The lorics left behind a stone platform with just one word carved onto it, unless. I remember being very upset reading this book. The Garden of Eden had been turned into a hellscape. The Wunsleer regretted what he had done and pined away, pondering what was meant by unless. But here's the thing. As he finished the story to the boy, he suddenly got the message. Unless someone cares, things will not get better. He handed the boy the last truffle seed and urged him to grow a forest from it, a forest that the lorics and the animals could return to. Dr. Seuss's story is the best piece of green messaging that I have ever come across. It's not just a great story, which speaks a truth to me. It has shaped my own understanding. It spells out the issues, the problems that we humans have created for ourselves. And it off offers us hope. The seed to be planted by someone who cares, that is the hope for the future of the world. We have a duty to carry that seed, to plant it, to nurture it, and we have a duty to bring our relatives with us, our friends, our neighbours, our nation and our world. We have a duty to grow that forest and for our society to value it. And we cannot do that without really effective communications. That's why I'm here. And that's why I really am looking forward to listening to the discussion here tonight and to learn more about how we can break through the noise and the negativity and together grow that forest. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lord Mayor. I think that uh, really sets a very good context for the for what's to come for the rest of the evening. Um, just to let you know, there'll be plenty of time for uh, for questions later. We're going to each member of uh, this the panel is going to speak. Then we're going to have the media panel. Uh, we'll have some discussion afterwards and then we'll open the floor to, uh, to questions. So I am going to begin my discuss by introducing uh, Oshian Smith, uh, who is there uh, at the end of the, the row. Oshian is Minister of State Resp Responsibility for Public Procurement, E-Government and the Circular Economy. Yeah, um, thank you. Alison. Uh... <laughs> The reason I have my mobile phone open is in case I got a text from the whip, which I've just got, telling me I've got to uh, vote, so, so that we still have a government, I've got to run. Uh, okay. it's, uh, I've got five minutes to get there. I'll just say on my way out that, how do we communicate the green message? <laughs> five seconds of each. Uh, we, not, it's not, the answer is, it's different for all of us. The message that comes is, it, we're not all going to communicate in the same way. And when I say green, I, I mean green with a small, green, small g. We are all going to, with the, the person who's delivering the message affects the way that it's received. You know, if, if uh, Pat Lee says something in his newspaper, that means something. If, uh, if uh, a, a girl who, was, who grew up in Mayo and moved to become a, a successful Offaly beef farmer is, co is communicating a message about farms, that's completely different from a south side person making a comment like this. Greta Thunberg is speaking as a teenage girl, looking at her future ahead of her. David Attenborough, a 90-year-old man still in great control of his faculties, looking back on his incredible life and his history. That carries a, a, a different message. Caroline Conroy who grew up in the flats in Ballymun and is now living in this house, I mean, that carries a huge message as well. So who sends the message is, incre is incredibly important. But the message has to be, the thing that's common is, the message has to be positive. We have to have an optimistic message. We have to show people a way forward. We don't tell people, stop doing that without telling them what they can do instead. We give people, we give people hope and help and optimism. We avoid blame and shame because that gets us nowhere. We have to... We must, we, we must give people uh, a positive, realistic alternative, which we really can do together. We have to do it in, in a holistic way. We have to do it in a cooperative way. Got to run and vote to the end. <laughs> Thank you. 
you know, most of the time when you do this job, you threaten your panellists with a trap door or a, pepper, a can of pepper spray. <laughs> that's, that's the fastest I've ever seen a, a contribution, and yet he managed to, to get quite a lot in. Um, now, uh, the next speaker is Senator Pippa Hackett, who is Minister of State for Land Use and Biodiversity in the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine. Thank you very much, Alison, and thanks everyone. It's great to be here and great to see such a full room. So I think you know this mess, this this topic is, is really important. It really is under you know it holds us all up in one sense in what we do and what we want to see and what we aspire to see. Um, I've actually not long before I came here was in the um, there was a dull debate on the nature restoration law, um, sort of from an agricultural perspective. So I was in there with my uh, two other ministerial colleagues on it, and you know. We did an opening statement, we listened to all the statements, and then there was a closing statement. But I think it's a good example of um, something that's topical now, something that's current, something that, you know, the default line is the Greens, we really want the nature restoration law, um, environmentalists really want it. Uh, farmers are like, absolutely, we're not sure because we don't know what it means. Um, but we still really want it, even though we don't even know how it's going to be implemented on the ground. Because it's not been decided yet. The information isn't there. So potentially you have this situation, and it's certainly few fired up in the last couple of weeks, where you have um, the debate is so polarised, and this is usually where we end up in this polarised debate. Um, and when the debate is polarised and you have environmentalists versus farmers in this example, nothing moves forward. And that, that's the thing that gets me, is that we have to try and keep things sort of centred. We have to keep sort of the reasonable people, if you can, if you can control that, discussing these issues. Um, with all due respect to any media people here, like the best, you know, everyone loves the, the Tim Cullinan versus, um, um, give me a name, John Gibbons, you know, because it's there. Sorry, John, if he's here, but you know, Tim isn't here, I'm sure. But I mean, the thing is that you know, it's great for it's great, it's great for them. He might be, you know, it's great for the it's great for the media, a bit of a laugh, you know. But it, it's not progressive. It doesn't bring us on. And ultimately, if we're all genuinely here, we need to be able to communicate to people that we we want this for the best. It's not so we can tell you what to do or you know uh, dictate what you're going to do in your future life. It's because we believe and we all in our hearts believe this is the right approach to take. This is where we want to see our country and our world and Europe move towards. And where we want to see it, uh, you know, there's probably no end in that. There's always something to be improved. Um, sometimes isn't where other people want to be. There's a certain percentage of the population who are happy to embrace this and happy to engage with what's happening and happy to try out new things and happy to maybe farm in a different way, happy to take public transport you name it, happy to retrofit their homes. And there's a whole swathe of the population that thinks, well, no, I don't want to do that. Why should I do that? I can't afford to do that. It's going to affect my livelihood. Um, and I think therein is where we struggle maybe sometimes with the communications because we really want things to be right in a very genuine, unselfish way. I think we want it to be right for everyone. Um, so I, I think that's the challenge, how we, how we make that difference. I think Caroline could have mentioned about the, and there is a difference between the public sphere and the political sphere, and I sort of learned that in my short time in politics. Um, I mean, take something, for example, like um, something close to our hearts as a party, like hair coursing. I mean, the vast majority of the public don't like that. You know, if you do the, the you know, all the surveys show, you know, 78%, some figure like that. Yet, that is not the case in the political world. We don't have commitment to, to look at that. That's just not happening. So we have to be conscientious, I suppose, of the difference between the public and the, the politics, even though the politics is ultimately meant to represent what we believe the public feels. It doesn't always happen like that. And I think also from a political point of view, I mean, that oft used phrase, politics is the art of the possible. And the other one is that, you know, let's not let perfection be the enemy of the good. I, I think that's just so important and I, I just find that even, uh, despite we might make the massive strides we want to make, 
some strides in the right direction for me are better than none at all or, or pulling back you know or, or reversing out of that and in a sense that was why it was so important for me you know I, I, I pushed hard for us to go into government and I, I I'm glad we did I think I think most people who supported us to go into government will be happy with what we've achieved in government but we've still so many things to do so much to do so much to achieve um, I've just one little example I give for my own area because I do live in County Offaly very much rural area um, surrounded by bogs, surrounded by farms. I am a farmer myself and that helps me in my communications to, to other farmers and to that sector because straight away I'm at a level. It's very hard to try and you know get to that level and then come with some more. But um, there's a little village close to me, well maybe it's half an hour away, called Pulla, which I think means hole in Irish, if any Irish speakers, because it literally is in the middle of the bog. Um, and I was there recently for a, an event where they were high, showcasing their small community and all the things they do. And every sing, and I wouldn't say there'd be a green voter in the village, if you like, you know, it's just that very conservative, awfully type place. Everything they did smacked of green, maybe with a small g. You know, they were community orientated. They were bringing, you know, biodiversity into the schools and the preschool. They were looking at um, upcycling. They'd upcycled all their Christmas decorations. They found them in the back of a shed from 20 years ago and rewired them. And that was their Christmas decorations that year. You know, they're probably doing things like water harvesting. They're on the Greenway, like, and they love the Greenway and they see what it has brought to their village. They have a community shop, you know, voluntary run. They fundraise from the local community to keep this little shop going. They treasure their, 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 their industrial heritage and their natural heritage. And, you know, I was so in awe of it. Like, they're doing it already. I mean, if every village did what they did in rural Ireland, we'd be a huge long way down, down the, the track of where we want to get. But I still felt sort of external to them. Like, I was, oh yeah, you're the Green Party, but we're actually quite green-minded. So that's an important thing from a, from a political sense, to make that connection, to connect us with the things people are already doing. You know, they were establishing a sustainable energy community. I mean, everything was ticking all the boxes. So um, I, think, I think, yeah, I think for me, you know, don't let perfection be the enemy of the good, but you still have to keep trying, you still have to keep pushing. But the communications is really important. We do want every, we do want the world to be better. We want people to live better lives. Um, but you do have to help them do that. So going back to the nature restoration law where I started, and I'll finish on this, the sense, I think, and, and look, at it, of, of course, once there's any fear element, you, you're on the back foot because you're always explaining, oh, don't worry about that, don't worry about this. Um, I mean, fear is probably the easiest emotion to, to um, you know, get people motivated. And, and, and we try it as well with the, with the, you know, ice caps are melting, world's going to burn up in a couple of years. Um, but bring it back to the, as local as you can to people. I think that works because people can relate to that. People can get together. And you need, there is a, one final expression is, um, there's nothing as uh, powerful as a community coming together, working together for a common cause. So if, if you build that community spirit, small at first, and make that bigger, then you're maybe halfway there in the comms. But I'll leave it at that for now, but happy to take questions later. <laughs> Pippa, thank you very much for that. I think plenty of food for thought um, for our, our discussion later. Now, our last speaker um, is from outside the parish, if I can, if I can put it that way. Uh, and I said to him uh, when he came in, I said, and what has you in here consorting with the, with the enemy? And he said, well, that's where you're wrong, just even using that term. Or was it the opposition of the enemy? I can't remember. But in fairness, uh, and, I, and I, I think it was through his, his connection with, um, with John Gormley that he's here, and it's Senator Malcolm Byrne, who I'm sure is very, very welcome, uh, who is going to give, I suppose, an outsider's perspective on this. Uh, Senator Byrne from uh, County Wexford um, is the Fianna Fáil spokesperson on further and higher education, research, innovation and science. Malcolm. <laughs> Uh, Asim, thank you um, very much, uh, and thanks to well, Caroline for uh, you know said uh, you know if this is outside the parish, I would better thank the parish priest for the use of the hall. Uh, so and and uh, clearly, I didn't get uh, the memo when we talk about stereotypes. You know, in other parties, the stereotypes of the Greens are often you know the Hawaiian shirt wearing, sandal wearing. Uh, <laughs> So we, d we didn't get the, uh, we didn't quite get the memo. Um, 
there, there is an interesting story, Alison, to your point uh, about, um, there's a story about Winston Churchill, um, who was showing a new MP around the House of Commons, and down on the floor of the House of Commons, he always said, always remember, he said, the opposition is over there, your enemy is behind you. Uh, and the challenges, the challenges often tend to be much more internally. Uh, and, and this comes back to the enemy of the good. You know, we can sometimes expect a lot more from those who are on our own side uh, and have very high expectations uh, there. I, I, I'm looking forward really to the discussion, the debate on it, but my... My big thought is, you know, if you're looking at communicating, it's communication is, is only the means to the end. What is the final goal here? And the final goal here is that we as a planet, uh, as a European Union, as a country, as communities, that we address the biggest existential uh, crisis, which is the climate crisis and tied with that, uh, the biodiversity crisis. So that's the focus. And if, if that has to be the goal. The communication strategy only leads uh, to try to achieve those goals. So what I would say for the green movement generally is there's a lot of success in that the issues are on the agenda now. Like if, if you think about, you know, people are talking now about uh, issues, even if they are wedge issues in politics, you know, they're being debated, they're being discussed. So I think that that is a first step. Um, I think that the, the second, which is, is the bigger challenge, is, is around just like any campaign. Uh, it's about getting the maximum number of people um, to, uh, you know, to support uh, the, ca the case. And I think if you alienate or divide or split away people, it becomes much more difficult. And I'd actually disagree with people. I think Tim Colnan needs to be in a room um, like this. And I'd, I didn't say you shouldn't. Well, no, no, I appreciate it. wasn't here. <laughs> um, but, but I think it's, it, it, it's important because, you know, I would have the contrast. So I was at a meeting on Monday night, uh, and it was a, a rural area in Wexford. It was mostly farmers um, in the room. Uh, and the mistake is often made that, you know, of farmers are against any issue uh, to address climate. They're not. Um, farmers are the frontline workers when it comes uh, to addressing challenges around climate. And it's important that they are seen as such. They've been involved in food production. They see the changes in the weather and what's happening um, on the ground. So they know it far more, dare I say, than some urban uh, dwellers around what is, what, is, what is actually happening on the ground. But like most of us, we all fear change. Um, so we need to bring people um, with us. Um, and for a lot of farmers, I mean, the, 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 there's a line that, that, that's used about one of them. Uh, it's, not being, it's not easy being green when you're constantly in the red. Um, it is a struggle. Uh, it is a struggle for a lot of farm families at the moment, and they fear any changes. So the argument has to be that farming has to be sustainable, both from an environmental point of view, but we've got to be able to support and sustain um, um, farm families as well. And I think the challenge, if it's coming out of, of this gathering, is how do we build allies? Um, and I, I would certainly say, and just my, my final comment on it is, you know, John talked about stereotypes and so on. I mean, I'm pretty certain in the Green Party, and in fact, I know in the Green Party, there were plenty of stereotypes about members of Fianna Fáil. And, uh, and I'm, quite, I'm quite certain we could even hear some of them uh, tonight. But, um, but actually, there have been a lot of really strong debates within the party uh, around, um, you know, what we do, how we support, how we support transitions in farming, uh, how we look at you know anaerobic digestion and investing in that area. You know, it's a big debate as, as Pippin knows on a regular basis in the party around forestry. Uh, we had a big debate around rewetting and so on. These don't tend to get leaked um, to the media. Uh, the the it, to, to tell you the story is, is is actually part of our difficulties. Politicians is when you don't get covered in the dollar Shannon say it again at the parliamentary party meeting and leak it, you'll definitely get coverage uh, as, as, a result, uh, as a result of doing that. Um, but it's, it's about building allies in, in, the, other, in, in the other political parties, because it's, it's all about coalitions. Um, I'm looking forward um, to the discussion, um, and I'd like people to please be as provocative and as challenging um, as possible. But what I would say is, again, please remember, what is our focus at the end of this? It's about how can we most effectively ensure we tackle the biggest existential crisis uh, that this planet faces? Thank you.
Now, I would like to thank Malcolm and Pippa and um, Oshian earlier um, for a really interesting uh, discussion, uh, which I think gives us a really good foundation for, uh, for the rest of the evening. And before I go any further, I think in the interest of balance, I feel compelled to ask John Gormley if he has any Fianna Fáil stereotypes <laughs> that he might, he might share with us. I'm, I'm guilty, I think, of, um, yes, I, I, I have to say, but um, now that I've left politics, I hope I can be exonerated about all the terrible things I said, but... Um, We're good with specifics, just yeah. keep in mind. <laughs> <laughs> um, you can have a think, you can have I, a think, I, I you can have a think. So look, this, this panel are going to uh, be absorbed into the audience temporarily, and I'll invite the next panel, if they would come up and, uh, and take their seats. Uh, and the next panel is the, is the media panel. And as I said, at the end, we're going to have the two panels up for, for more chat and then, and then for questions. Yeah, I might grab. Thank you. So I'm going to introduce all of this panel before we have our first speaker. Uh, it's a, as you can see, it's a, it's a bigger panel. Uh, right here beside me, um, I have, I was going to say, Captain, you're, you're, now, you're now in my chair, but that's okay, Dave. No, 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 I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. No, 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 Dave, please, please, I was joking. Can't take a joke. Um, so, uh, Catherine Cleary is here beside me. Catherine writes Game Changers, the Game Changers column for the Irish Times, and is a founder of Pocket Forests. Next to Catherine, we have Rosalind Skillen. Rosalind is a columnist with the Belfast Telegraph and is a master student of environmental policy at UCD. Just beside her is Tom Malloy, who is the Green Party Director for Communications. Tom was previously group business editor at independent newspapers and editor of the Kilkenny People. Uh, beside Tom is Pat Leahy, who is the political editor of the Irish Times. Pat's books include The Price of Power, Inside Ireland's Crisis Coalition, and Showtime, The Inside Story of Fianna Fáil in Power. And last, but by no means least, we have Dave Robbins, who is the director of the DCU Centre for Climate and Society, and a former journalist with the Irish Independent. If you could welcome the panel. Thank you. <laughs> So I am going to invite Dave Robbins up, if you, would, if you wouldn't mind, Dave. <laughs> I was trying to make it up to you. Get it over with. Get it over with. Um, thanks very much, Alison, and, and thanks, John, for the invite. Um, yeah, I, I basically research climate change communications at DCU. So the more I research it, the less I understand it, basically. Um, but if we think about communications as a process that has three elements, the, 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 the building of the message, which can be a competitive process amongst different stakeholders, for instance, nature restoration law, there's a battle as to who's going to win the narrative over that. Is it going to be inv the environmental side, the f industrial farming side, different political interests? There's a battle to establish the dominant narrative around lots of things. Then, so that's kind of pre, pre commute Then there's communication itself, like the texts, the media coverage, different press releases, different videos, whatever it might be put out to the public. How are they framed, constructed? What are the key phrases and messages that go into them? And then the last piece is how it lands with audiences. And as Oshin was saying, how it lands with different audiences depends on a lot of different variables. Um, so the, these are the processes that we study. Uh, one piece of research I did do was to interview ministers and handlers, media handlers, in the last Green government, if it's not too traumatic to, to go back to the 20, uh, 27, 2011 time in government, about their communication <coughs> strategies. And what I, what I found there was that the, the Green Party media people and the Green Party ministers themselves didn't really think about those processes in a strategic way. My sense was somebody who comes up to politics and gets in to be a minister is already a very, very good communicator, but in a sort of natural, heuristic, 
ad hoc way. I'm good because I'm good. They're not thinking about these strategies about how to frame certain messages for uh, different audiences. So um, just, uh, uh, I, I, I wasn't really sure we were going to be asked to speak, so I've kind of got lots of random notes about how to improve commu communications. This, there's lots of research about, you know, you have to um, tailor the message for different, segment your audience, and you've got to go to where that audience is, where, whether it's on TikTok or whether it's on podcasts or wherever it is. So you cannot expect your audience to find you. You've got to find the audience. You've got to frame the message in a way that resonates with them. So you have to understand where they are. There's no point in talking to people from where you are, because where you are is like... I see my colleague Dermot Torney here, we're always saying, well, we're in the bubble. And we probably all here are in the green bubble, but most people aren't. Um, you've got to focus on positives, as Ushin said as well, on solutions and opportunity, because uh, talking about climate change and climate action as a sacrifice or as a, um, you know, a, that, a, that climate change is a looming disaster, it, it can engage people, but it can, it can induce a certain uh, a fatalism ab about action. So um, I would be careful uh, about that. The other thing I found, and sorry if I'm overusing my time, Alison, you can open the trap door any, any minute, that um, I, I have been involved in working with media organisations about their climate change coverage and how to kind of strengthen it and deepen it. Right? The government could fund environmental journalism. They, are, they have agreed in, under the, the Future for Me Media Commission report to fund local journalism like council reports and court reports. We in DCU lobbied to have environmental journalism included in that because environmental journalism is, is expensive to produce. You know, you're sending people to COP meetings, you're sending them to different conferences. Uh, you, need to have a, you need to have somebody who's trained in it. Um, so that's one thing that the Greens in government could do, which is to increase the climate literacy of the media themselves. Because I, I found in my interaction, look, climate science is a vast and fast-moving uh, area with lots of different specialisms. Um, so it's difficult for journalists to understand. And as a former journalist, I basically went in there uh, because I was good in Eng at English and bad at maths. Okay, so journalists are not naturally numerous. Apologies <laughs> to my colleagues here. So it's a, it's a tough. You have to kind of again going to where they are. Where are the media on climate change? They're struggling. You know, they're struggling to understand the science. They're struggling. You give them a peer-reviewed paper, and they have to evaluate whether that's good, re a good research, good research design, good methodology, or the, you know, what's what's, uh, what are the key findings? They are. I think they're they're under pressure on this. And the more we can help them in terms of giving them lit climate literacy training, trying to sort of grant aid environmental coverage, is um, it, uh, would, would be a good step. I'll share just, I'll finish on a little anecdote um, about the recent IPCC uh, synthesis report. And I was watching the press release from somewhere in Switzerland, I can't remember where it was, uh, live. And P uh, Peter Thorne from the Newth was speaking about it. And I, I, I sort of heard him say, the main finding of this report is that the solutions to climate change are all at our fingertips. Okay, and I thought, oh, this, this is different, right? This is a very different message to normal IPCC report, which is, could be summed up in, we're all going to die. So um, I, I uh, was talking to Peter about this, and he said, yes, um, what happened was that the IPCC comms people had prepared the we're all going to die script, but that he got together with a couple of the other people on the committee and about five minutes before going live on air, ripped it up and decided to go with this positive messaging. And that is kind of how it was reported. Because if you get in first and you set that narrative about positivism and solutions being available, then you set the, what the research calls, you become the primary definer of that issue. And if you can get in there early, you can set that narrative. So thanks very much for listening, and I, I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you.
Dave, thank you very much. I think there's some really good meaty information there um, for us to digest and to, to discuss later. Our second speaker uh, is Catherine Cleary. And um, as I mentioned earlier, Catherine is, uh, writes the Game Changers columnist for the Irish Times. Thanks, Alison. Um, I think maybe I need to change the name of my column to The Game Is Not Changing Fast Enough, people. But anyway, let's, uh, let's start on a positive note. I was earlier today at the, um, the Hotspot Circular Economy Hotspot, which is a European um, conference about the circular economy. And lots of people were there and lots of ideas were being um, put around about how to communicate and how to... Uh, tell people the good news that, that the changes we need to make are good for us in all kinds of ways. And uh, somebody said, somebody in government actually said, an official in government said, we are good at change. And she was, she was talking about the plastic bag tax, remember that, and the smoking ban. So those were achieved without, in my memory, a massive feeling that everybody's entitlements were being thrown to the wind. And, this was hurting poor people, or this was, you know, these were things that we got over the line, um, you know, more than a decade ago, with a kind of a feeling of cohesive community behind them. And it became a, like a world-class project, the plastic bag tax. We were world leaders on that. We weren't laggards. We were doing things that made massive sense to other governments. They looked at it and said, look what Ireland's just done. And people looked at their plastic bags and said, yeah, actually, these are pretty horrible. And, I can stick a, a bag for life in the back of the car and off I go. So we are good at change. We are easily frightened, as Malcolm said, by the idea of change. But again, I think the more frightening change is the one that, and again, as Dave has pointed out, the doom scenario is too frightening for people. There's a new report today about eight of the planetary boundaries. We have crossed seven of them, just to inject a tiny note of doom into this. But that is too much. And even reading that, I find myself thinking, I can't get to the third paragraph of the story, because why would we bother? And we're a small country, and what difference can we make? So it, it goes in. So we've gone from denial to doom without stopping at doing, which is the middle road. And uh, it was a, a woman from Scotland at, in my group today who they put together a fantastic campaign around COP26 um, and it was that brilliant madman level of beautiful design, an advertising campaign, a simple poster campaign. They posted them around the route between, for the delegates that they were taking to the conference around food waste. Uh, and they got a famous photographer called Rankin to be the, the, the uh, role model for this. So they, they fashioned lots of mucky looking food waste into the shape of a bottle, so an arresting image to start with. This was on one side of the poster, a black image, beautifully photographed, and the other side was a kilo of food waste has the same carbon emissions as 25,000 plastic bottles. So you're suddenly stopped in your tracks going, oh my God, I've been thinking I'm a great environmentalist by recycling my plastic bottles, but actually I need to start looking at this food waste thing. So there are brilliant communicators who can tell us the story, as Oshin said, tell us not to do this, but do do this, because if we do do this, we get to a very good place. The difficulty now is we have what, whether it's social media allowing this to, to become more amplified, but the vocal minority who are against change um, are foregrounded and they become in our heads, they become the people whose voices we are listening to. Um, it's partly to do with journalism. We love a row, it gets clicks, conflict sells. Um, so the row is what, what the microphones are gonna to go to, while the person over here with the solution is kind of boring and dull. Um, so we do need, as, we need to, as journalists, figure out how to make the boring and dull solutions as sexy and interesting and clickable as the rows. Um, Shane Timmons, who was there today as well from the ESRI, he's a psychologist based in Trinity, and he was talking about the congestion charge in London. And the research they did around that was when it was being suggested, there was massive resistance. It was one of the most unpopular measures. Any politician looking at those numbers, as I'm sure if we did one today in Dublin, would say, I'm sorry, I can't die on a congestion charge. There's no way, way this will happen. 
But once the congestion charge was in place and they did the same research, people were quite happy with it. They said, yes, this makes massive sense. It makes a city that's much more livable. It makes the people who are, you know, who are using the city infrastructure the most, the people who pay for it. Um, so that idea of moving from the fear of change into a situation that's already in place, you know, we're, we're happy that, that things happen. Once those things happen, they are much more accepted than maybe the, the research that, uh, you know, before the change happens might suggest. So there is a sense of just strengthening the spine and putting these changes in place because they are so desperately needed. Um, the other figure that came out today was the CSO figure on emissions in 2020. Agriculture emissions were 38%. Um, the carbon cost to farmers of that is three euro a tonne. The carbon cost for householders who are paying for their emissions is 207 euro a tonne. So while there is absolute sympathy for farmers and acknowledging their hard work. <coughs> and as Colin O'Regan said, it's a, really, it's a really hard thing for somebody who does a hard physical job for you to tell them they're doing that wrong, they're gonna get really fed up. So I absolutely understand why farmers are really fed up because they've done everything they were told to do. But at the same time, there is an incredible societal injustice in allowing one sector to uh, produce that much pollution and uh, putting the burden on householders to reduce their pollution. So we are a collective, cohesive community, much more so than other countries that we see crumbling around our, our planet. Um, and I think that idea, as, as Ocean Smith was saying, you know, he, he talked about a positive, realistic alternative. And those solutions um, that were talked about by Peter Thorne and the answers to our problems are when you dig down into them and when you look at the science and the evidence and the idea of regenerating soil, the idea of transitioning to clean energy, the benefits that come not just to the health of the planet, and by the way, the planet will be fine, it's just its habitability might be you know, disrupted for 50,000 years, um, <laughs> but it will be fine in the end. Um, so those solutions are based on the science, they're based on hard fact, evidence there isn't uh, you know it's not a belief system that you have to try and persuade people to buy into it is you know we are increasingly understanding this and I think it is good that environment is now being talked about so much back in 2008 after the crash as a journalist the only e-word you were allowed to get upset about was the economy the environment was put on the back burner to an astonishing degree which is why we are where we are now today so it is incumbent on people who, story, who tell these stories to tell them in a way that brings people along, makes people feel part of it, makes people feel that they belong to it. Pippa's story about the small village, I want to go and visit there, it sounds amazing. But yeah, there is that incredible team spirit in, in Ireland, all across Ireland. We saw it during COVID when the messaging from the media was very clear. Nobody did a what about this, what about that, everybody delivered a very serious public health message with a huge responsibility uh, as journalists. And I think we do have to think about climate in those terms as well. This is a very serious public health message. Um, I'm gonna finish with Kate Rayworth, Michael D's favorite economist. Um, her book, Donut Economics, is a wonderful read, not least because the opening of that book is, all, is her description of the Holocene, which is the, the, ge the not geographic, geological age that we're now living in. And the Holocene is the best this planet has ever been, thanks to the plants and all the organic matter that has created this incredible, beautiful planet that we live on. And the Holocene, if it is protected and if we can manage the climate in the way that hopefully we will, now that we know the problems, can last for another 50,000 years. So we have to go for the moonshot on this. We have to do this. The other great line that really rings in my head from Kate Rayworth, she talks about not trying to change systems. So you can see that happening with the energy system. There's no point in trying to make fossil fuels cleaner. They won't ever be. So we've got this incredible clean energy story happening at pace, partly thanks to the Ukraine, horrific situation in Ukraine. The clean energy story is a really positive one. So you don't try and change systems. New systems come along and they make the old ones obsolete. But we have to help those systems 
and help to communicate how much better those new systems are going to be in order for the old ones to become obsolete. And unfortunately, the old ones have so much money and they can workshop talking points like this will hurt poor people, this will cost jobs and put those into our ecosystem of information. So we do have to challenge that at every turn and we have to stand up to it. We have to, with kindness and understanding where people are coming from and what their fears are and being able to relate to those fears, but also to explain calmly and logically, this system will be better for everybody. And it's not about, it's not about shaming, it's not about, nobody knew that these were, these were wrong. Well, the fossil fuel companies knew exactly what was happening for decades. Um, no, but you know, apart from that, people who are part of the system don't know. So I'm hopeful, but I'm also galvanized, and I think storytelling has a huge role to play in getting us to the, the next stage. Thanks. Thank you, Catherine. I think that was really very uh, well balanced between doom and, and doing, um, which I think is one of the most important messages uh, that we can have tonight. Uh, next up is uh, Pat Leahy, and Pat is political editor of the Irish Times. Thanks, <coughs> Thanks Alison. Good evening, um, everybody. Um, I I'm sure I made... Uh, John Gormley's life miserable are, well, I mean, I wasn't all my fault, but yeah. I contributed to making his life miserable when he was in uh, government, but I have enormous respect for him then and now, and so when he asked me to come along tonight, I was very happy to do so. My thanks also to um, the Lord uh, Mayor for, uh, as Malcolm says, the use of the hall. I think she said earlier it was built in 1715, so my journalist Matt's Dave tells me that's about 150 years ago or so, so very impressive. <laughs> I'm, um, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be here, but uh, I'm, I'm slightly worried um, uh, that not enough people have been giving out about the media. Uh, but, uh, so let me, encourage you, um, let, me, let me encourage you to do that. Um, uh, uh, frankly, I find that, that slightly, slightly worrisome, uh, as I always do when people don't uh, give out about the media. But maybe we'll, 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 uh, we'll get around uh, to that. Um, Malcolm quoted, but when it comes to politics, um, let me stand up. Uh, for the media. Um, Malcolm quoted uh, Winston Churchill, so let's give another old racist a run tonight and um, quote <laughs> Enoch Powell. All the top racists are getting an, uh, an outing tonight. Enoch Powell said that uh, a politician complaining about the media uh, is a bit like a ship's captain complaining about the sea, um, which uh, I, I, think there's, I think there's something uh, to learn from. And uh, the media anticipating some of your criticisms uh, to come. Um, it's not, and I, I, I disagree with my dear friend uh, Catherine. Uh, I'm not sure it's the media's uh, job, and I, I speak as a practicing political journalist, obviously, um, uh, and so that's my perspective on it, but I, I'm not sure it's our job to win the arguments um, for you, for, for the Green Party or for the Green Movement. It's our job to report accurately, fairly, comprehensively, and critically on that argument as it takes place for my purposes within the political milieu. But just as it's not part of the opposition, um, in my view, uh, the media is, is, is not an arm of, uh, of government either. And there is an argument. There is a political argument. There isn't an argument about man-made carbon emissions heating up the planet to the extent that it means the future uh, of, of all sorts of life on Earth uh, is imperiled. There isn't an argument about that. We can maybe, there's some argument about timelines uh, and that predictions are difficult, especially uh, about uh, the future. Uh, I mean, you don't uh, have to do an awful lot of research to come uh, across multiple instances over the last 50 years or so of, uh, of us all being told there was 10 years left to save the planet. And I think if the uh, the Green Movement, the environmental movement more broadly, is honest with itself, it will say that it has been the boy who, uh, who cried wolf uh, on, on a number of occasions, and maybe that has lost it some, uh, some public attention or some public argument. But the whole point about the boy who cried wolf is that the feckin' wolf turns up in the end. And, uh, and I think that's a point that could more usefully be made. But there is an argument. So if there isn't an argument about that, there is an argument, a viable political argument, that we see 
played out in front of us and, as, as Pippa would say, uh, I, I'm sure, uh, behind closed doors a lot, about the pace and design about, uh, of the measures that are necessary to, uh, to counteract global warming and to cut the emissions uh, that, uh, that causes. And that argument is a viable one. And it's our, I don't think it's our job to win that argument. I think it's our job, as I say, to, uh, to, to report on it. Um, and that means that part of our job, even though practicing politicians, I'm sure, find it tiresome, it's our job to report on the political wrangling that, uh, that takes place around climate action. And of course, as, uh, as Catherine says, we tend to give more attention to where there's, uh, where there's a row. It's, it's more entertaining, it's more interesting, it's got more personalities in it, and our data tells us you know, that you know, people are a lot more interested in that than they are in, uh, in, in, in stuff about policy and that. But it's through the rows that you can often define yourself in policy terms. It's through the rows within government, the conduct and resolution of them, that gives you an opportunity to get your message across. I mean, inevitably, there'll be compromises on, uh, on, on policy issue. But rather than were I to be in government, and you know, this isn't a, a, a seminar giving advice to politicians, uh, they will even make up their, their own minds, but were I to be in government, I wouldn't complain about journalists covering rows within government, I would use that fact to communicate my message. And you don't have to look very far to see examples of how that might be done. Last week, the Taoiseach sent out a couple of junior ministers to provoke a row over the budget. What did we do in Leinster House all week? We ran around after that story, and uh, as Micheál Martin uh, as Micheál Martin acknowledged at a doorstep, entertained everybody uh, all week uh, with stories of that. That's the way the, the media works, and I think you'd be an awful lot better off within Leinster House and the environs of Leinster House around government buildings and realising that fact and trying to turn it, um, turn it to, your, to your use. Um, and I think, you know, just because you approach that row with good intentions doesn't guarantee you of, uh, of anything. But I think if you make your case fairly before the public with conspicuous bona fides and the Green Party is treated a little bit differently, I think, to many other parties uh, in, in, uh, in, in Irish politics by the public, then I think you, know, you stand a very good chance of making your case heard, of getting your message uh, out there. And uh, Pippa had quite a row in the, uh, in the Dáil Chamber uh, today with one of the rural Greens. And you know, I often think, and the, 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 the rural, as the rural independents rather, and the rural independents, the regional independents, and non-aligned independents seem to reserve a special vitriol for the Greens uh, within government. And maybe there's an extra edge to that vitriol when it's a, when it's a woman green. But, um, uh, but I often wonder, is that maybe because they realize, rural independents realize, that the green message, if it is communicated to lots of people in rural Ireland, will be very attractive to them and might threaten some of those rural uh, independent votes. Let me say I'm looking forward to questions and the discussion, but let me just say one or two other, uh, other things. Um, and this is in the way of self-criticism, uh, uh, I guess. Uh, while we may be reporting on rows within government and compromises within uh, government and budget rows, rows over climate action uh, and, and so forth, I think when it comes to climate action, we have a responsibility that we, we don't always live up to, and that's to put the correct context global, environmental, national, uh, on, of the bigger picture on those, uh, on those rows. And often that's where we, that's where we get loud. We treat, we treat only of the row rather than of the context in which it uh, takes place. And it's also part of our job to bring people face to face with 
the consequences of the policy changes that the government that may make or the changes that they may or may not choose to make in, uh, in, in, in their own lives. The consequences of action, but also the consequences of, uh, of inaction. And uh, I, I think possibly that is, um, it's a fair criticism of us that, that sometimes we may, we may fall down uh, on that. So look, I'll, I'll, leave, I'll leave it there and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Pat. I think we can safely say we are getting the basics of what should be a very good discussion later. Um, our next speaker is Rosalind Skillen. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, Rosalind is a columnist for the Belfast Telegraph, but also a master's student of environmental policy in UCD. Rosalind. Yeah, thank you so much. It's really nice to be here. And thank you to John for the invitation to speak today. Um, so I just want to start off by saying we have like a climate crisis and a nature crisis and I think in part that stems from the communications crisis that there is like we've had the knowledge for so long yet it's not being translated into action so something clearly isn't there and I really just don't think people understand how far we need to break it down like the circular economy hotspot is happening at the minute and that's really brilliant and I've been there with work and it's brilliant to have like 400 people over from across the world and I was like writing about it and tweeting about it and then so many of my friends were messaging me like what is the circular economy and like no one had even explained what that is so I think even in terms of the language that we use it's super scientific super technical it's really inaccessible for a lot of people um, even words like net zero which are like commonplace to us or even like visualizing what carbon is I think we need to think of more imaginative ways to really communicate um, and I guess I see my column in the Belfast Telegraph as a way then to reach a new audience and we talked again about like who we're speaking to and I think one of the best pieces of advice that I was given was like to when you're writing or talking on the radio to talk as if you're speaking to your friend's mum because that's usually like for in my age group the demographic that you are speaking to and the people who are reading and like people I don't think people buy the Belfast Telegraph to write, like read about climate um, but then they'll come across a column maybe that's talking about it so I always think like okay making it accessible like entry point um, and I think that's really really important um, but then thinking about what works and it's been highlighted um, a few times this evening in terms of local campaigns um, and local solutions that people can really identify with and I think being really like narrow and focus um, and really specific in your communications is really great like in Northern Ireland when trees were felled along the lagging towpath that was like a crazy example where people were so outraged and that was like really a uh, local green space that was so important to the community um, and then it was really easy to communicate about that and for people to get on board um, and as well like recently writing about the water sewage in England like that's gained a lot of traction people really interested in that because no one wants to swim in dirty rivers um, and as well the disposable vapes question that's coming up and the EU are looking to ban disposable vapes and we're pushing for that in the UK as well but um, disposable vapes is a really interesting one because you've got the health angle as well as the climate angle so I guess that brings me on to the second thing I wanted to say was just about talking about the co-benefits of climate um, I just think that's so important and um, I started writing for the Belfast Telegraph in 2021, so not as long as a lot of people here. But even since then, I've noticed that it's so much easier to talk about things like fossil fuels. Because of the cost of living crisis, people often think then of like the huge bumper profits of fossil fuels companies. So it makes me talking about um, ending fossil fuel exploration and extraction a lot easier because I can talk about it from an economic perspective as well. Um, and I think the health angle is like hugely underexplored. Like when they release the um, report like two weeks ago when it was about how the Irish diet is like driving people to death because it's so heavy in meat and dairy um, but again that was a huge opportunity for like the health angle um, and health and climate professionals contributed to that report and I think that lends a legitimacy and a credibility so I think we need to see a lot more like joined up thinking in that regard um, and of course then um, money as well because as it's been raised this week at the circular economy hotspot a lot of the people who are interested in environmental Mental issues that like, tend to come from like middle class backgrounds um, so I think it's really important then that we're thinking about solutions that are like socially just and inclusive as well um, but then moving on to think about the challenges um, I like find it really hard personally when we're talking about climate it's 
generally quite negative i'm so trying to think of like positive news stories and i know there's really nice examples of that um like solutions journalism and rte do that like local climate heroes piece which is really nice going up and down the country looking at people who are doing really positive things um on a really local level um and i work for an organization that's the representative body of reuse and repair in northern ireland and we're doing a podcast series bringing in um, our member organisations to talk about reuse and repair at a really grassroots level. So that's like repair cafes, men's sheds, she sheds, toy libraries, lending libraries, toy libraries, human libraries. Um, so that's really good because again, it's providing people with really practical examples and a way of like overcoming that challenge of always being negative because I do think that we need to, yeah, as people have said tonight, be a bit more positive in our outlook as well. Um, and then again, one of the challenges that I find, and I would be really interested if anyone could speak to this, um, is just obviously I've talked about the fact that it's important to keep it local but really aware of the fact that in Ireland we're not yet experiencing the most adverse impacts of the climate crisis and we saw the huge media coverage of COP26 when it was happening in Glasgow which is just across the water but when it was happening in Egypt in COP27 we didn't see it um, make, like make headlines in the same way and again like me and Shauna Core from Belfast Live were the only people over from Northern Ireland. I know there was like quite a few people from the South, which was good. Um, but again, like I think it's really important that we're also not like um, writing ourselves out of the global picture. And um, the articles that I would write on global news stories just don't like do as well. People really aren't as interested. So I yeah, that's a bit of like um, yeah, I would like some advice about that in terms of how you can really write about um, the global climate stories because as much as it is important to keep it local, I think it's really important that we recognise like our responsibility as well um, in the global narrative as well in terms of climate action. And then Minister Hackett touched on it briefly, again, um, about the media pitting climate against agriculture. And we saw that in Northern Ireland last year with um, two climate bills going through the Northern Irish Assembly, which is like the most Northern Irish thing ever. So we had the private members bill, which was um, by the Green Party, um, Claire Bailey, the former leader of the Green Party, and then the um, Edwin Putts bill, which was deemed like the bill for the farmers. Um, and that really wasn't very helpful because then that created this sort of like sense of opposition um, and people became further entrenched in their views it was very polarizing um, and i'm often asked like when there's a just stop oil campaign or something to go on to the radio and talk about it and then you're put against like um, maybe someone with opposing views say a dup minister or someone from the ulster farmers union and i really um don't think that that's productive i think it's really healthy to engage in conversations with people who have opposing views but i don't think i think it's very much how you frame the debate in a considered way and talking again someone raised about like the outcome and what you want and i think that's really important because i don't think that those kind of conversations do progress people because people just become more entrenched and that's the nature of radio and it becomes a bit like a boxing match and I would much prefer for example to have a conversation about banning disposable vapes and to have someone from the vaping industry a health expert and an environmentalist I just think that will be a lot more productive personally but um, people might disagree with that um, and then finally just to touch on modes of communication because um, obviously we're all writing um, or speaking um, and Caroline the Lord Mayor talked about storytelling and I think that's obviously really powerful obviously Irish um, mythology we have like a huge heritage of storytelling and I think really maximizing on that um, podcasts radio video um, I don't know if anyone else saw A Note for Nature which was a really beautiful documentary about um, biodiversity loss across the island and when I went to the screening the director afterwards on a panel said they were going to put it in the science fiction kind of genre like a David Attenborough thing but they made the strategic decision to make it like a cultural piece because they wanted to incorporate music and that was again a way of reaching new audiences so I thought that was really powerful and again a different way of communicating the um, message around biodiversity loss and you had like a lot of poetry and song and music in that which was really beautiful and finally um, environmental murals that's something that we've been working on in Northern Ireland obviously murals in Northern Ireland um, kind of communicate politics and sort of mark territory in a way so our environmental murals are a way of showing that we belong to one earth kind of um, towards that sort of environmental peace building looking at what unites us more than what divides us um, so we had really subtle messaging so it's not like in your face you maybe wouldn't know it's about the climate crisis we had um, a mural of a curlew a bird that's going extinct in Ireland um, pictures of bees and biodiversity and butterflies 
butterflies um, and um, a mural of an ice rink looking at like tipping points and stuff and I think um, again you never really know who's touched by that and the way that that maybe resonates with people um, you'll never know but I guess you hope um, and that yeah it's just the note that I want to conclude on I guess that um, ultimately my key message would be that communications should be um, about the co-creation of hope um, and should be driven by hope rather than fear. Rosalind, thank you very much. I know we're, uh, all of the, the speakers are speaking to one um, theme tonight, but I think we, we're hearing a great diversity of views and ideas um, in what are really very well chosen, chosen panellists. Now, our, our final um, uh, talk of the night is going to come from Tom Malloy, and Tom, I suppose, also has that experience from both, both sides of the, of the fence, as it were. Currently, Tom is the Green Party Director of Communications, but previously, as I said, has, has, has worked in journalism. Tom. Thank you very much, and it's really, really nice to be here. Not least because you know I spend a lot of time thinking about this particular issue, and when I talk to other people who work for other green parties around the world, trying to communicate, we all have one crisis, one thing that makes us feel really bad, which is how can it be that in almost every country in the West, people say that the climate crisis is the most important thing or the second most important thing, and yet the party that they represent, the polling figures suggest a completely different thing. So why is this? What's happening? Well, I, I don't know the answer, but that's why I'm here, to take notes, to listen. But I have a few, few simple suggestions. One is, and it's been touched on by many people, it's optimism. I think that's obvious. Voters vote for optimistic people. You see that in American elections most of all, but you see it everywhere. But there's also a thing I think we miss. It's very peculiar that, that there have been many successes. When I was a boy, everybody talked about the ozone layer and the ozone hole. That has been cured, you know? And I remember seeing it on the news. I was passing by in an airport, and it was about number, item number five on Sky News. Oh, the ozone hole, it's no longer a problem. We don't talk enough about successes. We don't talk about rivers that are now full of fish again. We don't make the point to the public that action does lead to results, and has done, and always will do, and that's why it's worth doing. As well as, you know, the, the, the doom narrative. I mean, if, if we really believe that, what's the point in doing anything? We don't believe that and it's not worth talking about. The second thing is we don't tell stories simply enough. You know, the truth is, and I've really learned this in the Green Party here, that the solutions are technocratic, and they're difficult, and they're big, and they're hard to get your head around, and they use words like Lulu CF, and nature restoration law, and, and you know, megawatts, and gigawatts, and so on, and nobody understands that in, 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 in the ordinary world. We, we tell stories, and that's what we should learn from journalism. Journalists tell stories because they're used to telling all kinds of complex stories. We're not the only complex thing out there. We're one of many things. We, we need, in one, some ways, to be more modest about that, and we need to tell simple stories, and we have to accept that sometimes just talking about one person in a kind of simplistic, slightly cliched way will make more impact than, than making the big narrative that people just don't get. Third thing I would say is, and this is certainly a mistake I made when I, when I, when I came into green communications, what works in one country doesn't work in another country. We, you know, the, the environmental movement is global. That's what makes it very exciting to be part of, and we can all draw inspiration from that. But the truth is that many countries, like the United States or Germany, they are already being affected by climate change in quite devastating ways. You know, whole towns are disappearing in tornadoes or floods. That hasn't happened here yet. And it probably won't happen here for a while, judging by you know, what's been going on. And you know, Irish people are very, very unusual this way. We're, we're among the least likely in the world to be climate deniers. But we're also among the least likely in the world when asked to believe that we personally will be affected by climate change. And that may be, may be the truth, actually, here. You know, if it goes up two degrees, well, it won't be the end of the world. But it will be the end of the world, obviously, for the global south. It will be the end of the world for people in Africa. And we, we, we probably need a different message to, to, I don't know, the east coast of the United States, where they're experiencing climate change in all its kind of devastating forms already. And the last point I would make is I think we're too polite in the, uh, in the, in the kind of green movement. I think we, we let people off. We, you know... 
we don't call people out. And I know this, I disagree then with some of the speakers here. I, I think somebody who drives an SUV, I think that's, you know, that's not a great thing. But nobody ever criticizes them. And I wonder why. And I wonder, are we just a little bit too kind of easygoing about stuff, too reluctant to, to criticize? Because our opponents criticize us all the time. They, they, they lie. They, they, they invent, they, they catastrophize. Uh, yes, I think we're, we're a little bit too polite. So they're my, my four little ideas. Thanks very much indeed. Tom, thank you very much. Now, if you'll uh, give us a couple of moments, we're just going to reconfigure up here. If I could ask the previous panellists to come up as well and to bring a chair. I'm going to stay standing, so... Um, now, I saw Oshian back in the room, but he yeah, may have... Back, yeah. Oshian is back, is he great? Um, minister, Oshian is... Uh, the minister is back in the building, but I'd say has been called out on a, on a call or something, so will join us. Um, so um, I was going to start with asking Catherine, in light of Pat's remarks, you know, just whose job is it then? Um, you know, to... Uh, should the Greens, like most other political, why should the Greens be offered assistance by the media in getting their message across if they're not able to do it themselves? Yeah, it's a good question. I'd like to reassure Pat that he can continue to do his job. You have my full permission, Pat. Right, uh, so, right. Yeah, <laughs> off you go. Yeah, the Punch and Duty show is good. You know, it gets, it keeps media organisations alive. It gets our readers interested. It is what we are interested in. But it's a bit like the improv line. Yes, and we need to get a more diverse kind of journalism happening so we can cover the rows. We can be critical of politicians. We should be critical of politicians. I'm not saying we should accept everything that the Green Party gives us. But people have talked about G Green with a small G, even just the word green. If we just talk about environmental or life sustaining or you know the things that will help us to survive. They're not issues that are confined to one political party. And I think it is our job as journalists to tell the stories of those solutions as, powerful, as powerfully and with as much um, personality and quirks and interest and talent as you bring to the Punch and Duty show. So I think, yes, completely continue to challenge politicians. And we are not here to be spokespeople for the Green Party. But as somebody with a platform, albeit a modest platform, I do have a duty to try and present the solutions that are there and the scientific evidence that supports those solutions as fairly and as accurately as I can. So it's not a case of winning the argument. Let's stop arguing and just get on with the job. So Pat, can I, can I ask you then, would you differentiate between, for instance, your job in Leinster House as a political editor and a sense of reporting it down the middle? Or does it come into it, the fact of the sort of the planet being on fire? And if I can put a part B on that, of what uh, Dave said earlier, how well informed do you think journalists are anyway on the, on the overall issue? And, and is there, are they upskilling on it? Yeah, uh, I mean, I think it's always very difficult to talk about the media in general terms uh, because obviously it's so diffuse and diverse and there's lots of different types of, uh, of, of, of journalism. And, uh, and some of that, and, and there is a place certainly for that advocate, for advocacy within uh, journalism. And, uh, but I think that you know, individual media outlets, um, you know, newspapers, broadcast stations, whatever, if they become purely identified by the side that they pick on it, then I think that damages their, uh, that will damage their authority. Because, you know, there are arguments uh, within, you know, the, uh, referred to some of them uh, in my remarks earlier, you know, about the timetable, the, the priority given to individual uh, climate actions, um, even I'm sure within the uh, within the Green Party, though I guess there are probably fewer arguments in the Green Party, Parliamentary Party nowadays anyway than there might have been more, more recently. But anyway, um, uh, I, uh, I, you know, 
I think that the media as a whole, which I've just said you shouldn't uh, speak about in unitary terms, uh, needs to be conscious certainly of its responsibilities, but also, um, also it needs to be conscious that it is speaking to a broad audience um, who don't necessarily buy in to 100% uh, of, um, uh, of, the, of the climate agenda. And, and do you, what about what Dave was saying, do you think that the media does upskill are enough journalists turning to people like Dave and saying, um, you know, in all humility, we need, to, we need some help here? Uh, you know, do we know, as, you know, as general, generalists, do we know enough about, uh, you know, the science and the detail mm -hmm. of every subject we cover? Uh, of course not. And that's one of the reasons why, um, I mean, I know, I know we do uh, in the Irish Times and RT have specialist correspondents. I mean, you know, I, I'd, I'd like to see us having two specialist correspondents dealing, uh, uh, dealing with this area. I do think it would become a more important element of the news agenda uh, over, uh, over the coming years. As an aside, um, uh, I'm, I'm not saying anything that I haven't written uh, here that I haven't written before. I think this idea, you know, that because it is in a coalition, that the Green Party is doomed to electoral defeat at the next election is, uh, I, I don't think that's true. I think there will be, you know, we'll see what happens at the next election, but I don't think it's inevitable because I think there will be more people at the next election who regard climate action as a really important thing for their government to be doing uh, than there were at the last uh, election. And uh, that's at least an audience that is available mm. to the Green Party. Whether the Green Party can persuade them to vote for it uh, is, uh, I is think, another matter. Thank you, Pat. I think Malcolm wants to, to take up a point. Yeah, it, 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 it's just one issue in this debate around the media. Mm. And I, I have to say, and, and you know, as politicians, we will always have criticisms about you know, particular journalists or so on. But with what you might call the traditional mainstream media in Ireland, we've been lucky here that it has been relatively balanced and fair and it's evidence-based uh, and tends to you know try to get two sides of the story i think our bigger challenge on this issue uh, is around where do people get their ac access their information from uh, and the world has, has, has changed enormously I, I have a theory that karl marx was right uh, and before anyone you know, definitely not a marxist uh, in case that that message gets back but Marx had this idea that you know, the revolution would come when the tools of production are in the hands of the proletariat. And if we think back you know, historically, decisions were made by government and they were communicated through trusted channels, the Irish Times, the Irish Independent, the Belfast Telegraph, RTE, to the populace. Now anybody um, can be a citizen journalist. The tools of production are in the hands of the proletariat. We have YouTube channels, we have, you know, people on Facebook, on Twitter, uh, you know, influencers. The probability is, I mean, most people below the age of 40 do not read a newspaper in the traditional sense uh, that, that, that they would have read it. For us as, as politicians, uh, and I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm very much around, you know, evidence-based decision-making. We're now no longer debating, uh, you know, with somebody who has a different opinion on an issue based on an agreed set of facts. We're now trying to deal with people who have different sets of facts. Um, and that I think is, is actually the, the bigger challenge yeah. is around operating in the social media space. I mean, the debate, I think Pat is right. I mean, the debate that is covered in the more traditional media, it tends to be balanced and it tends to be more around, you know, how quickly do we reach, you know, a particular goal. So the debate in agriculture is, do we cut emissions by 22% or 30%? You know, and there's the, there was the row over, over that and so on. I mean, we're dealing then though with social media where, you know, the, the entire message is, is, is rejected. Um, and where, where that presents, and just to find in this, where that, that presents a challenge for us as politicians is that that is now also finding a political voice. So Pip and I, you know, would, would disagree on, on, on different issues within our own parties. We disagree, but we agree on the same set of facts. There is now emerging, and it's, we've seen it in other countries, um, people who are just not agreeing on, on the basic facts. And I think that, with respect, is a bigger challenge. Mm. 
I might actually, in a minute, Rosalind, I might ask you a bit about your social media experiences. But Pippa, first I wanted to ask you, I, sitting at my, my computer and with being so old fashioned, also having um, newspapers, uh, I decided just to look over the last 48 hours at the, I had the Independent in front of me. And I'm thinking that what I'm about to read out now exactly the sort of thing that would have had Tom sitting at his desk gritting his teeth. So yesterday's headline, front page, now, and even the use of the word now, to what was it, 20,000, how many cows? 200, I have 200 here, and that's obviously wrong. 200,000 cows must be culled to hit climate targets. Then another one, Eamon Ryan continuing to block bail on guard the body cams as Harris proposal stalls. Today's front page, green plan to tax the rich fall, falls flat in EU Parliament. And then finally, a more local story, removing residents parking for cycle lane on Dean's Grange Road, St Dublin, will destroy our community. Now, Pippa, are they picking on you or are you failing to communicate? Um, again, I think it plays on that um, fear factor. And, mm. if, if, and I think everyone will admit that people are frightened of change. And yeah. I, I think at the start, if you get the communications wrong, then you're in a much bigger hole to come back out of that. You mm. know, when you're explaining, you're losing. Um, and that's why I, I mentioned about the nature restoration law. None of us really know what it's even going to look like, yet we're here mm. saying, we want this, you know. Um, we don't even know the figures, the proper data around re-wetting. We don't know what, how much, what is re-wetting, how far high we need to bring the, the water table. Yet we're still, we're, 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 I'm, we're, not, we're not wrong to champion it, but it's hard to champion something when you don't have the facts. You, don't, you can't articulate to a farmer in County Offaly, well, is it my whole farm? Is it a field? Is it going to be underwater? I mean, the, the most extreme is, you know, you see the cartoons, yeah. they're going around in canoes. This is my farm now. Um, but that, that will happen because we don't, have, we don't have all the facts. We don't have all the data, yet we are sort of charging on with these things. And I think that's, that's a challenge. Um, so given that context, if you like, what about Tom's argument that you should be saying to the SUV drivers? get out of it, it's bad for the environment, How, why, why would you possibly need it driving around a city anyway? Well, I mean, you, you, you could say that, I suppose, you could say that, no, but, but then a lot of SUV what, drivers what are farmers who have a tow bar and they need their SUVs, yes, so then I you're breaking you can contextualize. that down. You could do that. But uh, maybe from an example from my own, because I am a, a beef and sheep farmer and mm. I get a bit of flack on social media, oh, sure, you're not a green, you're a farmer. You're not a green, you eat beef. So if we're going to, if, 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 we, if we took that attitude, we, we'd merely you drive a car, you fly a you've been in a plane, you're not green. You could take that to the nth degree, there'd be no one left to vote for us. Yeah. Um, and I know we don't command the Green Party many votes from farmers, but if we are to make this, you know, tackle this climate mm -hmm. and biodiversity emergency, they're the main cohort that we need on mm -hmm. our side. So and you would, it, so it would turn too many people off to call them out in that manner? I'm not saying that we, I mean, I call them out when I see bad mm -hmm. stuff, but I, I would certainly, um, the best part of my job is getting out and about and putting my wellies on and visiting farms, you know, through my job and, and otherwise. And I would target the farmers who are making massive strides and doing things differently, way ahead of the curve, you know, ahead of government policy in some t places. Because they get it and they can see it works for them and it's they still have a viable farm. And they're the ones I will champion and go out. And they're, they're becoming more and more, you know, out. There's more of them out there, yeah. um, but that they don't have the voice. They're the sort of quiet minority as well. They're not the loud minority. There's actually their quiet yeah. minority mm -hmm. because they're just getting on with life. Thank but they're you. the ones we need more of. Dave, you you would once have been the person writing those headlines in the Indo, or some of the headlines in the Indo. Mm -hmm. You've seen it from you've seen it from both sides. I mean, to hear to to, to see that list. What do you think? What's the dynamic there? Um, well, th there's a few things going on there. Th th there's, a, there's a whole theory around news values. What, what, what a thing has to have mm. to make the news? And one of, you know, um, conflict is one, yeah. negativity is another. So journalists are trained, and, and this is something I'm trying to kind of challenge a little bit, and I'll just come back to something Pat was saying mm. earlier, in these trainings with journalists to challenge the automatic ways they have done their job you know for hundreds of years this is a new dispensation maybe they need to question some of the things they do newsroom cultures are very strong professional cultures are very strong this is the way we've always done it this is the way it's done in this newsroom and that's i'm trying to you know just get them to sort of pause and reflect and say is there another way 
uh, of doing this. How, and and why? Why? Briefly. Well, why would you tell them they need to do that? Because I don't think the way that the media is addressing the cli climate crisis is fulfilling its roles in terms of like its social responsibility role, its informing the public role, it's even holding power to account role. It's, it's not serving them well. Mm. It's good for smaller, you know, less pervasive topics. It, it doesn't, I don't think it works for something like climate change. And I do ask them, you know, Powell's saying it's not my job to make the argument for the Green Party. I, I do ask in these workshops, well, what is your job? Is it to be just a bystander, you know, counting the scores at the end of each round? Or you're part of the world, you operate in an environment, you're part of this, you know? You're, 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 you have, you're in this. Mm -hmm. And how are you going to, how are you going to conduct yourself? Um, in a, there's lots of debates in journalism studies about that idea that you can have a view from nowhere, you know, you just report in an objective. Mm -hmm way, but I don't know if that's really working with climate change. Okay. Rosalind, you mentioned about this whole idea that you could be asked onto a radio show or a podcast against an adversary for the whole punch and Judy type of, I was going to say discussion, but row really. And I was curious that if you express a reservation to the producer or the researcher, whoever's asking you, or try and say, that, try to posit it, that it'll be posited more positively, what's the reaction you get? or? Uh, well, I guess usually they have a story in mind and that's the mm. one that they want to pitch, but I would just always recommend people who would be able, if they wanted that particular point of view, right. they want a youth climate activist against um, like a DUP spokesperson, then I would just be able to pass them on to someone. Mm. And what, and in relation then to, you're saying your experience of, of social media and that, and do you find it's generally positive or what? Um, yeah, largely positive. Like any time on Twitter, obviously, there's like all the comments like climate change is a hoax, mm. climate change is a scam and stuff. But in general, I think um, people really like a uh, person behind a message. Mm. Um, and I think it makes the whole um, issues around climate change a bit more personal. And I've noticed in particular around like campaigns and petitions and online mm. activism. Um, and recently, like, um, they are reintroducing the climate ecology bill in Westminster and they brought over like four climate activists and we were kind of writing about it and um, posting about it and that was really to just break it down so again make it more like relatable relevant to people um, and just to put up the link and this is what people can do and I think again to go back to reuse and repair which is the space that I operate in like waste is just really unappealing and like unsexy mm. and very difficult to talk about but when we're talking about like nappy libraries toy libraries and able to like show photos show videos that really brings it to life mm. so I think that social media is good in the sense it can really bring an issue to life and that it's really powerful. Well, and obviously, I suppose you are also doing it in such a way that you have your narrative, you has you have your visuals, and you have that yeah. positivity. Yes. That and exactly. it's your experience of that is then that, that that works, it carries through. Yeah, I think so. The only thing is, um, I guess people don't tend to stumble across things mm. in the same way. So um, where you might like flip um, on the paper and see an environmental column that you wouldn't have stumbled across mm. otherwise in social media, I guess, because of the algorithm people, mm. um, you're kind of hitting the same people a lot of the time. Yeah. So yeah. Um, maybe not breaking out the echo chamber. Thank you. Tom, I wanted to ask you, on the, on the basis of John saying, all, all was open for discussion. I'm curious, I could sense some of your frustration in your, in, your, in, your, in your speech and a sense that you were thinking, like on one hand, you totally understand that prerogative we're talking about, bad news sells better, all of that. You, you've been that soldier uh, or the, the going on the attack. But yet now you're here and it's a sense that there's axes being thrown while the Greens then throw back bouquets. And no. there's that inequality, and uh, and that how is how is that how is that ever going to be redressed without without I suppose the without a hardening of the of the attitude? No, I, I'm not frustrated. I, I'm I'm amused some of the time. Look, the way newspapers and radio stations and TV networks work is there's a hierarchy, and and people like Pat. Paul calls are at the top. Oh, They're the top the dogs. <laughs> and then you have the business editors, and then you have the sports editors, and so on. And every day there's a news conference. And every day people speak up for stories. And often I would argue with my, my Paul call colleagues about business stories. Let's say, I don't know, the IPO of Aer Lingus, the shares in Aer Lingus. The business guys, uh, the Paul calls be saying, oh, the minister says this, and so and so in the opposition has said that. The way a business journalist thinks is, 
this is where the shareholders are stacked up. This is who's going to win. And, and they're much more, and the people who read business pages make big bets on, on the analysis. You know, they put, put money behind the stories. So there's a, a different kind of rigor. And what I can be frustrated about mm. sometimes is that, that, that the whole issue of the environment is about much more than the Punch and Judy show. Of course, Punch and Judy show is part of it. But, but there isn't you know, a room to debate a lot of the science. There's not room to debate a lot of the research. And I'm not sure that, that the people are there in the media organizations with sufficient firepower to challenge the poll calls or the business editors and say, you know what? You shouldn't be, you know, this company may have a great share price, but it's creating a huge amount of carbon. It isn't viable in the long term. Or this company, uh, this politician is saying such and such, but actually it's just inaccurate. And let's call them out. Let's do a job on this politician for telling lies about environmental. That, that doesn't happen because, frankly, most of the time, the, the environmental editor is not a powerful enough person in an organization. And that ultimately, it's the choice of the editor. The editor decides who is powerful. The director general decides who is powerful. If he decided or she decided that the environmental editor was you know, higher up the totem pole, mm -hmm. then that would be the way it would be. So I, I, it, it's not good enough for me, and I say this, so many of my friends are journalists and, and editors, but it's not good enough to say, oh, this is just what the public thinks. It is a decision, a values-based decision. You know, do we take the environment seriously, or do we just treat it like everything else? Is it just a political thing, or is it more than that? And, and you know, if there were two or three pages in every newspaper to fill on environmental matters every day, it would be a completely different discussion. Yeah. Catherine, what is your experience? You write a weekly column uh, for the Irish Times on a Saturday on environmental matter matters, generally positive to my, to my experience. What is your experience of the receptiveness of what we might call the MSM, the mainstream media, to, to hearing about the environment in that way, or about caring, the need to care for the environment? Um, it's mixed, and Tom, I give out about SUV drivers all the time. You can't hear about that. Um, yeah, I mean, I think to criticize my own career in journalism, I took the I took the rule book seriously and I, I played by the rules in my earlier career as a news journalist, uh, you know, always keen to, to um, be be the be the bystander, not be part of a story, because once you become part of a story, you're uh, you're compromised. Um, and I then moved into writing about food and farming and agriculture and you get more space and time to meet people and find out deeper stories than just your daily uh, news stories that you're covering. But at every turn, the sell to the editor about how, oh, by the way, we're going to lift the milk quota in 2015. Let's have a look at the potential environmental damage that a massive increase in the dairy herd could cause. Um, there's very little interest in in putting that into the paper. Now, in fairness to the Irish Times, and I think the Irish Times is a good example, and I think we need papers where lots of different views are because we don't want to end up with a Fox News, CBS type scenario, you know, and we do need to have lots of different views. So they did, we did print a piece, and I wrote a piece, a very strong piece, about the challenges that a massive increase in dairy herd was going to have. And it caused not a ripple in the po political scene, it caused not a difference, because it's not just about the story, it's also about the placing of the story. It's about, you know, mm -hmm. politics and journalism are enmeshed together. It is not a simple way that a politician has a message and it gets to the ears of the public without baggage or without spin or, you know, that, and that happens within the ecosystem of journalism and politics. Mm -hmm. So it's much easier now to write about the environment. I think the media are learning well. I think there are brilliant journalists, um, Rosalind uh, being one of them, a new generation of brilliant journalists who are evolving journalism. You know, everything is evolving. We're up against social media. It's a nightmare to be a journalist at the moment and try and figure out, are you trying to break the news? Or are you trying to be the trusted voice who explains the news? And I think our role in the future is to be the trusted voice. So I think we do have to inform ourselves. We do have to keep objectivity in certain parts of you know, there, there is a very clear line. If you're a reporter, you're objective. If you're a columnist, mm -hmm. you can have an opinion. And those are really good 
rules that we can play by. I think there are, the structures of journalism are incredibly good. I'm proud of being a journalist. I'm proud of the Irish Times. I'm even proud of Pat Leahy every now and again. Um, <laughs> who, is both, who is both the journalist and the columnist. <laughs> but when you're finished, uh, but yeah. I think we have, you, you know, back in 2008 and in the early days, the first, the first Green Party involved in government, which I had a, a, an upfront seat on because my husband was a, a Green Party advisor. And it was, I am quite triggered by those days because his job was to try and get those stories to the ears of people who, and again, had that worked, had that been a success, we would be so much better off now than we are looking at trying to address a, a deeper hole. But the narrative, and it was a narrative, and it was a bubble, and it was you know a group thing, was that the, the Greens were clowns. And by the end of their time in government, they were dangerous clowns. And we, st we haven't got much further than that this time around. Um, and I'm not as optimistic as Pat is that the, the party is going to come out unscathed by their time in government, but... Oh, well, I didn't say that. Someone <laughs> 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 said it was a foregone conclusion that they would come out unscathed. So I've seen it from both sides. I've seen it from the spokesperson for the Green Party who was trying to explain, this is important, this matters. But I've also seen it from the journalist side, and there are, they are very... Um, you know, they're, it's impossible to separate those two ecosystems and say that journalists are not playing a role in how the environmental agenda, and let's call it the environmental agenda, not the green agenda, please, but they are playing a massive role. As Alison's, um, you know, litany of horrific headlines from a paper in 2023 in Ireland, you know, that's a shocking and shameful state of affairs, um, and, and we need to call it out. <laughs> Um, I was just going to make a, a, a sort of reflection on, I know we're talking about farming a bit as well, but the farming sector is the only sector that I know of that has its own bespoke um, news outlet. You know, you've got the Farmer's Journal, you have, you, okay, the Farming Independent and the Independent on a Tuesday, you have the Farming Examiner on a Thursday, you have online ones, you have AgriLand's a fairly significant player, that's farming, there's probably one other one I can think of. But, you know, your young farmers and your, your older farmers and, and a lot of rural people get a lot of their information from the Farmer's Journal. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not saying they're not reading the other papers, but certainly, I don't know what the, 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 the there's 80,000, maybe they say 300,000 readers a week, they say, whether that's online and that, are reading that. And they're getting their, a lot of the information. So, uh, look, uh, I don't want to trash the paper, but it's, it, it, it's pretty difficult like, to get a, an environmental message through that. Mm -hmm. They've one or two quite fair, fair journalists who will attempt yeah. to do that. But I mean, the current editor is very you know, anti-organic, anti-green, spends his, his editorial most weeks is having a bash at something or other that the Greens are doing. So that message is filtering through strong and thick to, to, to a lot of people across the country and the very people, as I said, that we will rely on in the future. And, and we can either do this with a great big stick, and I, I really don't want to have to do that through regulation, and I just don't think that's the way to go, because you're not really going to get the system change in farming that we need. We need the system change in, in transport, about how people get around. We need the system change in energy. We need a different way of, the whole construction sector gets ignored in all of these debates. Massive emitter, massive. Um, and, and farming, um, obviously a, a huge emitter as well. Um, but um, I think just, that's just one point in, in relation to that. Um, okay, and then just, oh, yeah. actually on Pat's point very yeah. briefly, and, and the point about when, do we get wiped out in the next general election or not? I mean, if there are more conscientious voters out there and we have a bigger audience, mm -hmm. I would like to think not. But I'd love to think, who are they going to give their green vote to? And are those people likely to go into government? Because despite yeah. us and our, we got 7% of the vote, and I think we've done massive things in government despite that, mm -hmm. even though people think we haven't done enough. It's a, it's a massive challenge for mm -hmm. us. We're really doing as well as we can, I believe. Before we go to questions, Dave, you mentioned your, your assessment or your examination of outputs from that previous Green government, uh, um, which I think underwhelmed you. Do you think things have moved on? Have, have they improved? Have lessons been learned? Um, yes, I think it's much better now. I mean, uh, one piece of research that I was involved in looked at just general coverage of climate change in the Irish media over 10 years from 2007. It was less than 1% of total news coverage. Um, it was like really, really, uh, if you chart the chart the, or trace the chart of it, it goes up um, 
at IPCC reports and huge spike um, at COP15 in Copenhagen in 2009 and then just fell off a cliff because of the disappointing outcome there but also the financial crisis. Coming up to COP26 in Glasgow, it was nearly back up to where it was in 2009. Um, I think it's just much more in the discourse now than it was then. Um, I did a piece there recently interviewing about 10 um, digital environmental journalists about changes they've seen. You know, say the person from The Guardian was talking about it. it's always on their home page. There's always a climate spot there. It's just much more prominent. They're, they've much more, um, you know, as Thomas saying, much more power in the newsroom. Um, there are many more ways of telling the story in different digital formats and so on. So I think um, it is an easier task to communicate or, or you know, get coverage for green issues now than it was back okay. in those dark days. Okay, thanks Dave. So no, there's somebody at the very back, a gentleman at the very back, who was very quick to... Do you want it to come back up to the panellists then, John? Hi, Philip Lee, is it on? So I just, sorry, yes, if you could, I should have said, if you could say who, if, if you would like to tell us who you are, that would be, that would be great. And if you have a specific panellist that you want to direct your question to, and if we could keep it to questions, that would be, that really would be great. Okay, thank this you. This is a question for Tom in particular, about the rest of the panel. Uh, I'm a, lo a lawyer and I agree that um, climate change and delivering climate change mitigation is complex, whether it's gigawatts or whether it's... Uh, changing the farming, the production of food, or whether it's the grid access or offshore wind and the ORES, it's quite complex stuff. And certainly, having been involved in it for almost 20 years, I can say hand on heart that until the Green Party came back into power the second time round, where I think Eamon had more control over things and you had a greater spread of politicians, with a bit of buy-in, I think, from people like David and other politicians, nothing was happening. So the real question to you, Tom, is, um, Great, as you addressed at the beginning, there is a huge awareness. How do you convert that into votes? Because my fear is that if you don't convert it into votes, we fall into abyss again because it requires politicians. It will require regulation. I don't accept that converting people into local community activities is going to deliver the dramatic change that's needed. Thank you. Thank you. Well, just if you, we'll bring back, I think John must bring back up the microphone if you. Yeah. Yeah. Will you be up? And we'll give it to. We might take a second question there. Yeah, just just behind you, yeah, and then the gentleman in front of you, and then we'll go for three. Yeah, come back to you. Is it on? Thank you, Malcolm, for framing the whole evening with saying that we face an existential crisis for all life on Earth, because in some ways, you know, a lot of what we've been talking about feels like rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic. Um, the sense of urgency, we all understand realpolitik, but I had a kind of a chastening lunch with kind of conservative family members a while back and they said, why did you green people not tell us how bad things were? You've never told us. <laughs> well, it's quite annoying, I can tell you, obviously, clearly quite infuriating. But at the same time, I believe that there's something that's not just about doom. There, are, there is no public education. You, ha you can have, you can have, you know, you, there's films on the TV, government sponsored, to tell you how to, to go around a roundabout, you know. I mean, and during the pandemic, there was public education. There has been no public education about climate change. Like, it's not just about you might have a little bit more wet weather or a bit more wind, you know. The fact is that if you know, it, it, we have, we, yeah, okay. It's, we, we all know if you get to a certain point that it's, it's curtains for everybody, really. So you don't have to talk about doom, but there's been no education really about how serious the situation is in any public media you like to talk about. That's what I'm trying to say. It's just, it's just a lack of it. And I wonder how people feel sitting here talking about rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic, morally how people feel when you know that it's not really going to get us where we need to be. So why bother? Absolutely without stating the urgency and giving people the dignity and respect of telling them the truth and no, gov the government has not done that and we have not done that. Thank you. So just the gentleman right in front of you, we'll take three questions and we'll go, we'll go back to the floor then. 
Thank you, Alison. My name is Aidan French. I'm a landscape architect and a past president of the Irish Landscape Institute, the professional body. They also run a small consultancy called Nature Based uh, Placemaking. Uh, a quick comment, if you'll allow me. I mean, the profession is very weak, and there's a whole series of issues there, but we've been ignored by successive governments, as John would well know. I also speak as a former member of the Green Party. I'm wondering, particularly with Pat, and I'm an Irish Times reader over 50 years, both digitally and every Saturday, certainly hard copy on a Saturday. Um, why? <laughs> It just bothers me that there seems to, and it's RT could be accused of it too, this, this dumbing down, this, this infotainment. I mean, the case of RT under the Night of Broadcasting Act, they're there to entertain, yes, but inform and educate. So it's kind of disappointing, this punch, of, this, this meme now we have tonight, but to Judy, I think it insults the intelligence of large sections of the Irish population who can understand complex issues. We had the abortion debate, and we had the same-sex marriage debate. They were able to grapple with those. So, I just find that really bothersome as someone who actually considered doing journalism back in the day. Okay, you thank you. Pat, I mean, I, I, uh, would you, uh, would you uh, agree that the Irish Times treats uh, climate coverage seriously? Occasionally. Occasionally, okay. Uh, okay. Far, just, just to say it's far and away, it yeah. publishes far and away the most climate change coverage it has done since the 90s. Okay, do you have yeah, any numbers so, on that? Yeah. This is like a movie line. Just before you start, Dave, do you have any figures to sort of give us a comparison? And I guess there's different kinds of coverage as well. It's not just coverage. You know, I, I'm trying to picture the graph in my, in my mind. It was way, way ahead from the mid-90s right. um, yeah. up until mid, the mid-2005, 2006. All media was appointed in the independent, and yeah. the independent yeah. started yeah. up. And the, so the end of the examiner and the times are... Time's still ahead, but the other two are okay. catching up or in, mm -hmm. increasing their levels of coverage. But I think it should be acknowledged that I know some people might be agreed that different views on the mm -hmm. coverage, but the levels of coverage, the number of stories, okay. the Irish Times is... is, is uh, so, Pat, as, as, as the political editor of the Irish Times, but also as a seasoned media observer, maybe you'd bring that into your, your answer of other media. Well, I mean... I, I, I take your uh, I take your point. Do we? There's lots of things that we don't do as well as we should do. I think there's probably more thing. We do lots of things to a better standard, to a higher standard than uh, than many other media outlets in um, uh, in Ireland. We are in a competitive financial position vis-a-vis. -vis, I mean, our chief we used to always worry about our chief competitor being uh, being the Indo. And there was, you know, however you may describe it, there was a, a more or less level playing pitch uh, between the two of us. But actually, increasingly, our chief competitor is RTE's online arm. Yeah. And RTE's online arm has the benefit of whatever it is, 150 million euros in, uh, in, in, in public money. Um, so that, that is not a level playing field. But within those constraints, and you can always plead resources. So I'm actually not pleading resources. I'm just putting it out there so you're aware of it. Um, <laughs> so, I, you know, I, I think I, I said earlier I'd like, to, I'd like to see us have another dedicated uh, correspondent uh, along with Kevin O'Sullivan. I'd like to see us having an agriculture correspondent. Um, but, you know, the editor has got, you know, 100 problems on his, uh, on his desk every day, many of those relating to resources and trying to maintain the standards of the Irish Times, because to speak only of the Irish Times, if we don't remain for many people, and some people may dispute it, that's, that's, uh, that's fine, but if we don't remain what we are, I think, for many people, which is one of the places that they can go to get news and analysis they can trust, then we've got nothing to say. Bri briefly, Pat, will you address your observations of other media then? <laughs> I mean, I don't want to really get it. No, no, go on. Well, and we'll, do the go, we'll start the GoFundMe for the that. Irish Times then after that. I mean, I, yeah, I, I, was, uh, I was kind of struck by those, uh, those Indo headlines, mm. you know, which uh, are a bit, you know, probably a little bit Daily Mail-ish um, uh, by the sense of things. But they also represent kind of an opportunity for the Green Party to, uh, to, be, in, to be in that argument. I mean, if the Green Party never featured on the front page of, uh, of the Indo, you might, have, uh, you might have a bigger problem. Yeah. And you know, just you talk about the, you know, the Punch and Judy stuff and how politicians get dragged into that. I think if you look at what, the way that Eamon Ryan conduct, 
conducts himself in ra typically radio discussions, because obviously radio is such a huge medium in Ireland. He tends to take the punchy punch and Judy stuff, not really get involved in trading blows, yeah. but to use the platform to get his message across. I okay. too remember the, uh, the the late Green uh, government between 2007 and, uh, and and 2011, and I think the Green Party actually learned a lot of lessons from that. Not least how to deal with that stuff, but also how to ruthlessly prioritize on a small number of things that they think they can achieve in government, put up with everything else and work to achieve Which I think is what Pippa has been sort of alluding to. Uh, Malcolm, you now and I'm conscious we want to get more questions going, so if, if, if you wouldn't mind keeping it relatively brief. We ha our first question was about converting all of this into votes. As a Fianna Fáiler, what advice have you to the Green Party <laughs> <laughs> on converting it to votes? Well, well, it is, and it's, uh, and it does come back. I mean, you know, politicians at the end of the day, and it's, uh, for, for most politicians, given the choice between saving the planet and saving your seat, uh, <laughs> saving the seat uh, will, you know, I'm, I'm all in favour of, 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 you know, biodiversity, but if it, you know, we've got to, and it, it comes back to, you know, when you have the complaints to media about, you know, why aren't you covering more of this? I mean, equally, you know, there's a lot of other issues. I mean, I would often complain about, you know, why is the media not paying more attention to me? You know, particular, yeah, to me. But it is because every politician we have our, our hobby horse issues and things we think we're really passionate about and we think are important. Um, I, I think, you know, we, we respond naturally to what we hear on the ground. I mean, you know, for me, the issues that I'm hearing on the ground at the moment, and which will be the issues in the next general election, are housing and the cost of living. Uh, this is what's, you know, emails, queries, it's, it's what's coming up. It's not that the other issues are not important, but these are the issues that are on, on everyone's minds. Okay, I'm and, thank and you, it's how, we, it's how we address it. Can I make one, just one other point, which is, is relates to the public yeah. funding media, and dare I say, Dave, I mean, the fact that The Guardian has, you know, pieces of its website around climate, Guardian readers will tend to be informed about climate issues anyway. Our, our challenge uh, is is about the farmers' journal much, readers. It is farmers' journal. It's about a much wider, and, and we might come back to the discussion yeah. about public funding of, of news as well. I think okay, that's, Tom, that's very, very briefly, and I have I have my three other questioners. Then yeah, just to answer the question directly to me about how, how I think we'll win the election, or not win it necessarily, but <laughs> do well, let's say. Um, I, I think it's a few simple stories. I'm beginning to think that the necessary nature restoration law is one of them. It's, the Greens are clearly differentiated. All the other major parties have come out against it. But I don't think that the public are against it. And actually, the Independent has come into a lot of grief tonight. They had a very interesting editorial this week, praising it. And I, I, you know, I was at a protest outside the door today, and there were hundreds of people of goodwill talking about this. I think it's going to be things like that that clearly differentiate the Greens from everybody else and remind people about why the Greens need to be in power. There will be two or three things, but I suspect the nature restoration law, which Pippa is doing a lot to, to shepherd through the Eroptus, uh, is going to be one of them. Okay, thanks, Tom. So just here, down, the gentleman down at the back with the black, and just here. Thanks, for you. So we take them together. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Hannah Lang. I study with uh, Rosalind at UCD. I study geopolitics. And my question is kind of twofold, so it goes towards both media and politics, whoever wants to take it. Um, it is about how we translate information or the sense of being well informed into a sense of agency. Because I think that is that bridge is lacking at the moment. Okay. And um, so how do we how do we create a narrative in which people have the feeling that they have agency when it comes okay. to sustainability? How do we dismantle this ivory tower? And the second question will be yeah. the tools of production have been <laughs> invoked. Um, so how can politics contribute to um, people feeling well equipped to incorporate that in their day to day lives? Okay. So just down at the back, thank you. There, the gentleman with his hand up. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah I'm just saying, I think it's important to say that nobody owns the environment, and no group of people own the environment, uh, that the environment is bigger than all of us, and that nobody has a monopoly on the green agenda. Uh, and that's not to take away from the very important role of the Green Party and other groups 
the all of the part to play. But I think nature itself is, is incredibly complex and subtle, and uh, wonder and humility is in order. So uh, we should never lose the run of ourselves. But there's one other thing that I think that we should take account that, that some of the tools of religion can be a help in this, I think, in terms of uh, praying or wishing each other well, including people who we find problematic. I think that is a tool that we shouldn't rule out. It's not all just about information. Okay, thank you for that. Just up here in the front row. This side, yeah. Thank you. Um, my name is Jamie Rohu. I'm a peatland jog from Trinity. Um, slightly pro uh, provocative question, perhaps, but it was asked for earlier. Um, the minister uh, said that people are frightened of change in Ireland, but I would contend perhaps we're more frightened of losing our privileges. Uh, discuss. Okay, might you? I'm going to take one more. Uh, yeah, one more. This, I think it was this gentleman he here, just at the very edge, if you could pass over the. Yeah. Alison, Phil Carney of Antarctica. I think, unless I missed it, the word advertising has not been mentioned mm -hmm. as yet. Is it unspeakable, is it unthinkable that any Irish media organisation would ban some ads? The long haul flights, the holidays, that are the, are the SUV ads. I'd like to hear if anybody's open to that possibility. Thank you. Now, I am going to start with the uh, losing privilege question. Have I any takers? <laughs> Catherine? Yep. Yeah, I think it's one of those communication challenges that Dave, as you know, and other thinkers in this area, have been very good at. The green message for a long time, or the environmental, let's go for the environmental message, has been about sacrifice and less. Um, and going back to that nature restoration, um, I, I think the more hopeful message and the one that is getting more buy-in from people is more. There is more abundance, there is more healthier food from more environmentally friendly farming practices, there is better mental health for people by greening our cities with Parker Forest, obviously. Um, you know, there are stories, and I don't know if anybody's seen the documentary 2040, it's a wonderful, um, kind of bad timing that it came out in 2020, but <laughs> Uh, it was a, an Australian filmmaker whose daughter was two in 2020, so he, with use of computer and fantastic graphics, he fast-forwarded viewers to 2040 if we made all the right decisions and showed, all right, yes, utopian but beautiful, a world where the energy is clean, where the oceans are clean, where food is being produced in regenerative systems, and equality is part of the picture and people have happier lives, that the cost of living crisis is, and the housing crisis, they're all connected, all these crises, you know, it's a cluster of crises that we are facing. And the decisions that we can make now, it's a bit like the Chinese proverb about planting a tree, when is the best time? 20 years ago, the best time to make these decisions, 20 years ago, the next best time is now. So, and I think that message of less is increasingly um, not what it is that that we're looking at in, in terms of the outcome. So it's not about it having to give up privileges, which could also mm -hmm. be called entitlements, uh, to drive your SUV into the Brown Thomas car park and the home, home to Ranla. You know, that kind of way of living in the world just begins to look like an antisocial act. In the same way that getting together in a room like we are two years ago would have been an antisocial act. We, will, we would have been hauled. You know, so there is, we can, we can very quickly change our thinking about how our behavior, and going back to your point about agency, I think, mm. again, we can learn from COVID. We had those daily case numbers that I know I was hanging out for every day. How many cases today, how many cases today? Well, how, imagine if we had, how many species are now, you know, how many nesting curlews are there today? I'd like to hear about that. I'd also maybe like to hear the parts per million of carbon in the atmosphere in that curve, because that's the curve we're trying to flatten. So there are all kinds of communication stories. Rosalind, you were nodding along there for much of what, what Catherine was saying. You're obviously in, in agreement with that, that take. 
Yeah, no, I have an agreement. Yeah. I think like, for so long it's been like the green austerity narrative, what mm. we have to give up. I think there's so much to gain, like clean air, green jobs, community well-being, and I think that just comes down to communicating the co-benefits of mm. climate. And I think it's then um, really important as well when people are talking about it that they um, like look out and enjoy themselves and stuff too, because obviously if it's a movement where there is like expressions of joy and hope, mm. then people are so much more likely to join than if everyone is like quite. Obviously, and do you see a generational gap there in that that is much more a way you I think I can speak safely and say that you're by far the youngest on the panel that mm -hmm. is there a different approach amongst your generation um, I guess a lot more people in my generation would be like crippled with ego anxiety and the idea of mm -hmm. not knowing where to start and that's why when the question was raised earlier about this like sheer scale of the climate crisis and like obviously um, like I really empathise with that. I think for so many people, it is just overwhelming if you just talk about that and talk about like, um, you know, ecosystem collapse and like for a lot of people, that's just crippling. Like I have some friends who like really struggle with um, depression, anxiety because of that. So I think it really is like breaking it down. Um, okay. okay. yeah. Pippa, I think. Thank you, Pippa. You wanted yeah, to take just, up that point. I mean, I think I think Jamie's question was good, and I think I think at the end of the day, equality doesn't come easy to humans. <coughs> Not naturally an equal race we, we want to we we our whole being is to be better or or richer or bigger or have more children or have more wives or, or whatever it is you know that we don't, we don't do equality one well. husband is enough for me anyway. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, and i think and i think in he's sense, great i don't could be wrong <laughs> share that um but in, and, and in one sense the covid crisis the covid crisis was interesting the covid crisis well and people do make the comparison maybe between why don't we take this as seriously the covid crisis but what the covid crisis did was made us all a bit more equal because everyone was restricted whether you're a brown thomas shopper or you're just going to your local center or wherever you were all restricted to the same level and but Climate action does not make everything the same for everyone. We are asking of certain sectors and societies, and I'm not saying that we shouldn't, of course we absolutely should, but that's where you're getting, you're getting, the, I mean, the people who have no impact on climate, who, have, who don't have to do anything at all but try and survive it. You know, we're asking nothing of those and absolutely shouldn't, the rest should help. But it's the, unequal, it's the inequality of, of the ask, and I think that's where some of the, yeah. then people are pitching their sector against another sector. We're more important than that. If you could pass the mic. Tom, with both your current hat and your former hat, what about the idea of banning those, those lucrative ads in an ailing industry? Yeah, I'd be really conflicted on that, to be honest. Um, I, I, I don't... I, I'd probably be against it. Okay, Malcolm, uh, I think, know, wants to. Fair I, enough. I think, uh, I think it's, as other people have said, it's, it's more about the change in mindset. Yeah. You know, it's, yeah. it's that when you see a lawn with no daisies, and no, you, you see that that's a kind of monstrosity, really, rather than beautiful. I, I think we have to change mm -hmm. the way we think. And, and as I was trying to suggest, maybe change the way we think about people who drive cars that are just unnecessarily polluting and dangerous to pedestrians and cyclists and so on. Uh, but, but banning advertising, banning media mm -hmm. from doing things like that, be pretty uncomfortable with okay. that. Malcolm? Yeah, if you, um, if you think that the Farmer's Journal might be negative, you know, seeing advertising banning, <laughs> wait, <until the, laughs> wait until some of the accountants in print media hear about those proposals. I, I, I actually think we're looking at it, I mean, it, it, it comes back to this question around our media space. Um, what I will say, I think we need to invest a lot more in digital literacy as well, um, uh, and in media literacy. Um, you know, people are scrolling through their phones, they're not challenging, uh, you know, the information that they're receiving, so part of it is about making sure that, that people are, are literate. But I, I don't think we should discount the crisis that media are in. I mean, Pat mentions around the challenges that the traditional print media uh, are happening. Uh, I think the government, and I think Catherine Martin, uh, um, I, I sit on the Office Media Committee, we support this, Catherine Martin was very supportive of establishing the local media fund to try to sustain, you know, local media, which is, is really important in terms of, you know, reporting about stories in our communities. But the media landscape has changed so dramatically, and we could, it's not like in the past where you could take ads off RTE. Um, you're now competing with, you know, streaming services, with online advertising, and so on. Um, 
So to, to disadvantage you know, the, the traditional media, if you like, I, I think would be wrong. I think the other big challenge, and I know Catherine referred to this with the idea of some sort of a, a, a fund for environmentalism or, 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 or funding it, this again is, is one of those challenges. So there's a question around to what extent almost governments, the hand of government is in there influencing media, media policy. I, I think we do need to make a decision around if we value good public sector broadcasting and public sector media. The, the issue of the TV license fee, which has been kicked down the road, and it'll pack up to it, the subsidy and that's there. We've got to decide, are we going to fund good public sector media? Um, and to me, the TV license fee is out of it, uh, it is, is a relic of time to come by. I think we've got to fund it out of general taxation, and part of that, I think, is about th those kind of public information programs about critical issues like the environment. Okay, I'm going to, we're coming, I'm afraid we're coming, and I see there one of my neighbours put up his hand, I will suffer for this in the future. <laughs> a man who holds a lot of sway in my neighbourhood, let me tell you. Uh, but we are coming up to nine o'clock. I was going to put, there was a question put, and I was just going to restate it to Pippa. I was listening today, I don't know whether you've noticed on the radio, there are these ads about how it's illegal now to threaten if you've been, you, you have intimate photos of somebody, and even to threaten to publish them. So that's a public information campaign of sorts. And, it, and even at that moment, it, I was struck by the fact we never appear to have any sort of a campaign on, be it positive or negative. Um, and after all the public information we had on COVID, which has been mentioned a number of times tonight. That was my question. Yeah. Yes, no, no, that's, no, sorry, I'm repeating your question. Yeah, yeah. That's your, yeah, and it's exactly your question I'm asking, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Sure. And I, and, and I think yeah. you're absolutely well. You're absolutely right, and I think, and, and it's not as if it's it's factual information. If you do, if, if well, absolutely, and if you you know if you retrofit your home, it is warmer, it's cheaper to run. I mean, there's so many positive stories in this, and as you say, we sort of leave it to the media, and it, they're all they'll tend to go to the big headline, page, page turner, clickbait headlines, which. You know, when you dig down into it, oh right, it isn't quite what it looked like, but it, maybe that's what sells paper. But the government has a role here to to, to get the information out there. Do you say we have we have ad campaigns for lots of things, uh, safety in tractors, carbon monoxide. I mean, you see the ad all the time. You know, your new one today. I mean, uh, there's a there's a. I agree. I think there's a big gap missing there, and it is something that they absolutely should be more proactive on. Okay, it's a matter of great pride for me as chair that it's just nine o'clock. <laughs> um, but first, before I, I really, I think it's been um, a really interesting evening, um, and I think the panel panelists have contributed an enormous amount, and there's just been so much information. So to Dave, to Pat, to Tom, Malcolm, Pippa, Rosalind, and Catherine. Uh, I would like to thank them very much for really, really um, uh, putting a lot of thought into it and I think uh, delivering an awful lot of food for thought and to thank you for listening so intently and I could see that there was loads more questions so that showed the level of engagement so I'm sorry that we couldn't come to that. I think I'm now, John, am I handing? Yes, I'm handing That's over to, uh, to John Gormley. So, Alison, thank you, and uh, I must say you did a fantastic job this evening, uh, really did. <laughs> uh, I'd like to thank uh, sincerely our, our Lord Mayor, Caroline Conroy, uh, for giving us this opportunity, giving us this beautiful room, a room I got married in many years ago, I have to keep saying, yeah, this is where my wedding reception was, got for free. Uh, <laughs> And actually, talking about getting things on the cheap, Malcolm, you mentioned my shirt, right? Uh, I, I, I actually got this shirt. I didn't know it was Hawaiian, by the way, but uh, I got it for five euro down in Ringsend, uh, second-hand shop. And uh, I think, you know, it's funny, again, it kind of reminds me of what happened there recently. Do you remember Eamon went out and st started talking about fast, fast fashion and how we couldn't embrace that? The next thing, another government minister goes out and launches a fast fashion shop. So there's these contradictory measures going out, um, you know, and I, I think perhaps what Phil said about I, I'd be all on for it, but uh, it's, it's one of those things. We've, we've got to navigate our way through these very difficult waters, and it's, it's not going to be easy. Now, I made, uh, before I, 
Um, I just made a few notes myself, but uh, before I want to get to the big issues. I see um, Malcolm Noonan, Minister Malcolm Noonan at the back there. I don't know if he's filling in for Oshin. Uh, Oshin had to go, but Malcolm, again, you're very welcome. We'd love to have heard what you have to say, but maybe there's an opportunity next time uh, when we have another follow-up, because, uh, I, as I said, I made a few notes, and I'll just comment on that later on. First of all, uh, I want to thank um, from our Green Foundation Ireland, Nuala Hearn, our uh, is our president, she's down there, and of course, oh, Nuala is gone, and Anne O'Connor. Um, Anne is always working hard every single time. We do this on a shoestring, this uh, Green Foundation Ireland, uh, but Anne is a stalwart and she's done fantastic work. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, Anne tells me, and I have to say this, she said there's a donation box at the registration desk, and remember, this event was free. So that's what she says. Um, now, just a few quick, you know, notes here, because it was a very wide-ranging discussion. And um, someone mentioned the plastic bag tax, and how it was Catherine, I think, you, you, you mentioned that, and also the ban on smoking. Now, this is interesting, because I have a little bit of an insight into that, uh, because I got to know the two ministers that were responsible. Uh, first of all, I was in opposition at the time, and I was kicked out of the doll by Rory O'Hanlon because I raised the. Pl I knew it was in program for government, and I, I raised it over and over again, and saying there's nothing happening. But then I found out why, and this is the interesting insight. Um, the plastic bag tax met with complete opposition by the civil servants in that department. They didn't want to know. Just didn't want to know. And when we talk about communication, maybe you know, we need to talk about communicating with our civil servants, the permanent government. You know, they, they, are, they are the ultimate. You know, they do make a difference. I can tell you that. I know it. And in relation to the smoking ban, well, that was completely different because there was a civil servant in that department who was an anti-smoking zealot and said, and Micheál Martin didn't have to do anything. It was all, it's a fact. So that's the difference. And, yeah, well, I mean, it's, it, but what I'm saying is that, you know this, Malcolm, you'd know about it, what we call institutional inertia. If you're up against that, it's very, very difficult. And that is something, maybe it's another opportunity for us to discuss the whole internal communications within government. That's very, very important. Um, again, there's a, the congestion charge in, in London was mentioned. And um, I, again, I remember that so well because um, I was over in London for the um, St. Patrick's Day. I went over there and I was on a stage with um, Ken Livingstone. And I was there beside him. and. There were all these people on the front, and they were all shouting, Boris, Boris, Boris. And uh, I turned to Ken Livingston and I said, what are, who are they shouting for there? He says, oh, do you know that guy that's on TV, Boris Johnson? Uh, uh, and I said, well, no one would vote for him. He's an idiot, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I was completely wrong. But, but what really killed Ken Livingston at the time was the congestion charge. It really had a bad effect on his vote. And I remember that so well. So again, it shows that um, a, you know, a very skilled communicator like Ken Livingston, he's up against someone like Boris Johnson, it can be extremely difficult. Populism often wins out in, in, a, in a lot of these things. Um, the whole question of, um, this, this is the thing that worries me. Dave, you know, you, you, and I've heard you talk about this a few times, the whole the positivity message and all the rest. Now, Adam McKay, who is a, a film director, and by the way, you'll notice that we're here busy trying to record everything as well, because we believe that you know, the message has to go out. We're going to send this out, and community television has a huge role to play in all of these things, we think, getting that message out. But Adam McKay is a very successful director, and he made that movie, Don't Look, Don't Look Up. And he said, you know, if we try to sugarcoat everything, um, it's a bit like um, you know, making the... Um, the fire alarm, which is supposed to do so, it's supposed to motivate you. If you're going to make that sound like uh, a Brahms symphony, like it's, it's, it's just not what it's there for. And so trying to get that balance right, I'm hoping that when we, and we are going to breach um, the 1.5 degrees warming, 
probably f much sooner than anyone thinks that that's going to be the big wake-up call. And because if we talk about it, Malcolm, you talk about an existential crisis. If this really is an existential crisis, if it's worse than any world war, you know, if you go down to Wexford during World War II, no one was driving a car because all the cars were up in blocks. There was rationing here. That's the sort of extreme measure, and I don't want to, I'm reluctant to go say it because of the way that it's, um, to come out with that at this stage um, would just would, would be met with total opposition. But that's where we're going with this. If we know it, people in this room know what I'm talking about. That's how bad it is. That's how bad the situation is. And the penny will drop eventually. So um, with that very uh, optimistic note, uh, <laughs> um, I'd like to, again, thank everybody. Uh, thank um, Catherine and Rosalind and Pippa and Malcolm and Tom uh, and Pat and Dave. Thank you very much indeed. You, you did a fantastic job. And, uh, and now, and now, and, and now the Lord Mayor is going to talk about free drinks for everyone. Okay. <laughs> he just spoiled my uh, line. Yes. No, just to say thank you very much for all of you coming here. Um, it's been fantastic. Learned loads and um, really appreciate the time and energy that you all put in because I know sitting up in a panel um, can be nerve wracking as well because uh, you never know what somebody is going to ask you. So thank you very much for putting yourself out there. Um, and uh, I do have the nice line to say there is a drink at the bar for everybody in the audience. <laughs> so enjoy it. Okay, thank you very much.